Thank you so much. You all look amazing from here. My name is Al Jared. I lead research operations at uh, Samuel Hall, and I'm very, very much delighted that finally we we are here. And uh, yeah, first off, it gives me great delight to welcome you to the Aga Khan University. And uh, as I've uh, mentioned, for today's event, uh, I will be uh, the moderator. Uh, we will, we are very well delighted to welcome you to this inaugural annual lecture organized jointly by Samuel Hall, the Akan University Graduate School of Media and Communications, and the Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations. The nature and form of urbanization has been changing rapidly in recent years, with Africa and Asia showing the highest threats. threats. It is speculated that due to the ongoing demographic shifts and growth of the world's population, there will be about 2.5 billion more people added to the urban population by 2050, mainly in Africa and Asia. And for that, would you'd imagine India, China, and Nigeria accounting for 35% of the projected growth. According to UNHCR, as conflict and climate-induced disasters keep pushing people from rural areas, a fair share of the urban population is comprised of displaced populations with more than 60% of the world's refugees and 80% of internally displaced people sheltering in cities. In return, the migrants and the urban environment are immensely affected by the urban fabric and the uh, changing evolution. Bringing East Africa and Southern or South Asia into the conversation will help us put into context related dynamics as seen by specialists who have been working in these regions. The themes that will be covered today are related to extreme heat impact on urban dwellers, including migrants, and will prompt us to think about the role of urban planning to build sustainable cities and environments that are inclusive of migrants and responses to thermal justice or thermal injustice, if you may. In addition to this, we have a photo exhibition, Beyond Borders, Beyond Labels, that portrays migrations, eternal and evol evolving nature. It features photos from Samuel Hall's Dreams Project and insightful pictures uh, by Mo Amin from the Camera Pics Library, who are represented today by Salim Amin, the chair and founder. We'll get a chance to interact with him later in the day. The event will also include a documentary screening in the afternoon and a Q&A session. To start us off, I have the honor of introducing uh, the Dean at the Aga Khan University's uh, Graduate School of Media and Communications, Professor Nancy Buka. I'd like to just share briefly uh, her profile. Uh, Professor Nancy Buka is an Associate Professor of Media and Communications, specializing in digital journalism, media management, and leadership and strategic communication. Nancy served in Kenya's Media Complaints Commission for a period of three years between 2020 and 2023, and is presently the Vice President of the Africa Journalism Educators Network. She also serves on the board of the East Africa Communication Association. Nancy holds a PhD in Communication and Media Studies and is a certified professional mediator. Please put your hands together as she takes the stage. Good morning. Uh, and as we say in East Africa, Habari is a suboy. Good. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, esteemed guests, distinguished participants, it is my pleasure to welcome you to um, the Aga Khan University Center here in Nairobi and to the Graduate School of Media and Communications. We're very delighted uh, to be collaborating with the Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations, uh, the governance program at the Aga Khan University and Samuel Hall to bring together this annual lecture and a workshop that promises to be quite uh, informative. This occasion is significant for us uh, in our academic calendar here at AKU because it's happening as part of AKU at 40 celebrations, which come to an end in March this year. We began this in March uh, of last year, and we couldn't be happier that this is one of the events that truly showcases the one AKU that brings together departments uh, from across the various geographies that AKU operates in. But more importantly, I think it also just shows the rich tapestry of expertise and disciplines across AKU. I am delighted that what started off as a chat with Sana 
um, one morning, uh, you know, has come full circle and we are here today uh, uh, to, to learn. Um, this year, we gather under the theme Asia and Africa in conversation, cities, migration and climate change. And as we embark on what promises to be an enlightening two days, we are confronted with the intricate intersections of two continents, each with its unique tapestry of culture, history and, and challenges. And this is a theme that resonates very deeply with the complexities of our modern world, where global conversations are essential for addressing shared concerns. And it's interesting that, you know, as a university, we exist in these two uh, geographies. The dynamics of cities, even just across East Africa, uh, the migration patterns, and even the pressing issues of climate change form the backdrop of today's discussion. And in an era where we are all interconnected, uh, <clears throat> understanding all these nuances of how Asia and Africa navigate these challenges become even more important. And one of the things that you know puts all this conversation in context is a speech by Prince Rahim Aga Khan at the World Government Summit in Dubai last year, where he said, people are on the move like never before. We are fast becoming an urban world. And the scale and pace of this change is breathtaking. Uh, by the middle of this century, it is estimated that eight out of 10 people will live in cities with much of this urbanization taking place in the developing world. How we plan, design, and manage the cities in the developing world, therefore, will be of vital importance, both for our fragile planet, but also for humanity. And I see this lecture series as a platform for us to reflect on those words even more and as we explore the commonalities that bind us together and the di rich diversity that defines our respective narratives. As we get into the discussions over the next two days, today and the workshop tomorrow, let's also spend some time to reflect on the role of media and communication in shaping perceptions, in fostering understanding, and in you know, pushing towards some meaningful change. The stories that we tell or not tell, uh, the narratives that we construct, and the conversations that we initiate as media and communications professionals contribute to the broader dialogue that shapes our future. And I'm delighted that we have several colleagues in media and communications that will be participating. Some of these discussions and recommendations will also go a long way in defining not just our professional development offerings at the Graduate School of Media and Communications, but it will also form part of the discourse in our academic programs, and more importantly, in our soon to be launched Master of Arts in Strategic Communication. As I conclude, I'd like to extend my gratitude to all the participating institutions and partnering institutions for making this event possible. It is truly a showcase of what is possible when different people uh, with different ideas come together. I look forward to participating and to listening to as many of the speakers as possible. And uh, as GSMC, uh, we commit to stimulate thought, to foster even deeper collaborations. This is just the beginning of you know, much more and to inspire action around the key issues that will emerge from the deliberations as part of the foundation for a future where Asia and Africa converse not only in words, but also in shared solutions. And we take this, you know, uh, with a lot of um, dedication. I thank you and I wish you all an enlightening and enriching Samuel Hall annual lecture and, um, and also a great time at the workshop tomorrow, but also as we, uh, you know, walk through the exhibition that will also be a time of learning and reflection. Asante Nisana. Uh, again, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce to you uh, uh, the chairperson of this year's uh, lecture, Dr. Nassim Majidi. Uh, then later she'll be um, introducing uh, the speakers uh, you know, for today. Um, first off, uh, Dr. Nassim Majidi is the co-founder and director at Samuel Hall, a social enterprise that conducts research in countries affected by issues of migration and displacement. Over the past three years, she has been leading participatory forum, forum planning sessions with civil society and the municipal stakeholders as part of a consortium on protracted displacement in an urban world in Kenya, Ethiopia, Jordan, and Afghanistan. She also has co-edited 
with Professor Karen Jacobsen, uh, who I'm told uh, was to be here today, but for some reason hasn't made it. Uh, the Elga Handbook on Forced Migration, published in October 2023, with a section dedicated to urban issues alongside philosophy, history, and lived experiences of forced migration. Uh, Dr. Nasi Majidi has published over 200, you know, uh, policy documents in uh, uh, different, you know, publishing uh, entities. Um, today, she will chair this annual lecture and invite our discussants to reflect on perspective approaches and co-production practices. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together as she also takes the stage. Jared, you're always too kind with me. I didn't publish 200. I did publish over 20 papers, but my team at Samuel Hall has been prolific uh, and a great support. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, welcome, Karibu Khosha Madid. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, so my name is Nassim Majidi, and I was born in 1981 in post-revolutionary Iran. My parents fled when I was five, and I spent most of my early years growing up in France. But as I was reflecting on the meaningfulness of today's gathering, I realized I've spent more time living in Asia and Africa than anywhere else in the world. And I'm very proud of it. 17 years of immersion, first in Afghanistan, in Central Asia, not far from where Noshin is, is from, just neighboring countries and Sana. Um, spent years in Afghanistan, where we founded Samuel Hall with Hervé, um, to understand how cities like Kabul went from half a million before 2001 to over five or six million inhabitants in just five or six years. How to cope with that? How do they cope with that? How do city planners cope with that? Um, and then we came here to Kenya 10 years ago, um, and I've spent most of the last decade across Ethiopia, Somalia, Kenya, similarly trying to understand why we still have so many people living in camps when we know how much they have to offer and how much cities have to offer. So we have tried to make sense of individual experiences, but also collective responsibilities that we have. And as researchers, we've made great strides in finding answers, but there's still so many questions and answers. And that's why I'm so grateful to have you guiding us today, our three speakers, to help us give meaning and make sense. They will take you through multiple spaces and places and will speak to one common experience, understanding and building human tolerance and endurance to um, climate change in cities and from the perspective of migrants. It's fundamentally also a full day dedicated to climate justice and to imagining urban futures. We will be talking about places and populations impacted for years. The photo exhibit shows us a historical perspective on these questions um, who have been impacted by the effects of the biggest polluters in the world, which are not in this room or which are not in this region, um, with disproportionate impacts on social populations. So let's make this two days a participatory one and a call for climate justice and more justice overall. When we set up our research organization, Samuel Hall, uh, in Afghanistan in 2010 and in Kenya 10 years ago, it was really with a dream and a mission that we would tackle some of these tough conversations with a critical, with an independent perspective to advance comparative research across Asia and Africa on the lives of the displaced, the hosts, women, men, girls, boys, across Afghanistan and Somalia first. That was our initial comparative angle that we wanted to take um, to understand how internally displaced populations were also living, how, how people who weren't able to escape um, the impact of climate change were living. Uh, but also comparing Kenya and Pakistan, two of the world's largest refugee hosting countries in the world, and all of these countries home to cities that are among the fastest growing cities in the world. We always had an urban bias. From the start, we have advocated for a world without camps, as camps were increasing and multiplying all over. Um, for access to protection, to jobs, to services in cities and in peri-urban areas. We also have a bias towards co-production and participatory approaches. We want solutions to be co-produced, co-designed, um, and 
Jared mentioned one of our ongoing programs right now, our ongoing projects on protracted displacement in an urban world is dedicated to that. We're leading a work package on participatory planning processes. So how to actually plan urban solutions with those who have so so for so long been left out of the conversation, uh, the displaced themselves, uh, community representatives, but also urban planners. We're talking about issues that most humanitarian and development actors aren't equipped to tackle. We need urban planners in the room, and we're, we have such a great representation here today. I also wanted to mention why this event is significant to me. Um, as a migrant, as a researcher, as a woman, as an activist, I'm proud to live in Africa, a continent that is today home to governments who are leading the defense, uh, the strongest defense for our shared humanity um, in multiple cities and forums throughout the world who are where other governments are failing. So Africa is taking the lead when others aren't. Uh, I am proud to live in Kenya. When I moved here in 2013, some of the progress that we have seen over the last decade wouldn't have been imaginable. Many advances and, and progress on refugee protection, on advancing out of camp conversations. And we're just at the start of it, but there's great leadership, great potential. And many of you in this room are contributing to those conversations. And I'm finally proud to live in Nairobi, a city that is rapidly changing and adapting. Uh, and that is home to many communities investing their resources, economic, social, and cultural, to make this city even richer and more diverse. Um, and the Aga Khan University, of course, is a great example and illustration of one of these investments in excellence, in education, health, and all those services which matter to urban, to urban uh, populations. So it's an honor to convene you all in this room today in this specific institution and to launch the partnership between Samuel Hall and uh, the Aga Khan University. Dean Booker, thank you so much for agreeing to join forces with Samuel Hall. It was uh, your vision, Sana's vision, Ali Khan, all of your contributions that made this happen today. As partners in Kenya, we hope to build on this first event, to build many more conferences, talks, workshops, discussions, uh, and we invite all of you to suggest ideas and to participate in them. So now let me turn to those who matter the most today in this conversation, our panelists and also all of you, uh, on the key issues of cities, migration and climate change in a conversation across Africa and Asia. Our keynote lecturer um, is Professor Noshin Anwar. She's the founder and director of the Karachi Urban Lab and professor uh, of the city and regional planning at the School of Economics and Social Sciences at the Institute of Business Administration in Karachi. She received her PhD in city and regional planning from Columbia University uh, and has held postdoctoral positions at Harvard University and at the Asia Research Institute, National University, Singapore. She's the urban planner we need in this room today for this conversation. Noshin's research looks at the interaction between vulnerability, climate change impacts, and post-colonial histories, context of infrastructural violence, land displacement, and anti-poor urban planning in the urban global south. She is particularly interested in understanding the multidimensional risks and uncert uncertainties that arise from these interactions and the gendered implications and impact on urban systems, people, and public health. She is also interested in understanding how the environment, how climate has been represented in post-colonial mid 20th century modern architectural practice and thought. Noshin is the recipient of more grants than I have time to cite uh, and more papers, um, but I would I would really encourage all of you to, to read all of her work and all of her papers. Uh, beyond being an academic, she's also an invested member of many technical advisory boards, including at the World Health Organization and the World Meteoro Meteorological Organization, um, to understand the risks of health uh, from indoor overheating. She is deeply committed to public outreach, to advancing the understanding of global and urban issues at a very local level, to foster the development of humane and political, politically inclusive cities. We will then have, in order of speech, Peter Kasaja, who is currently finalizing his doctoral research on power and informal urban infrastructure at Makerere University in Kampala, Uganda. Uh, your research fits uh, fits into your broader interest in urban informality in Africa, 
and in African cities and the various dimensions, including urban infrastructure. I know you focus a lot on waste management and sanitation, as well as livelihoods and associated vulnerabilities to climate change. You are also interested in critically examining the various dimensions of urban informality using a political settlement lens to generate alternative insights into how multi-scalar politics, um, local, city, and national levels uh, intersect to reshape complex geographies of urban poverty, inequality, and vulnerabilities to climate, to climate change. You are part of the Informality Working Group initiated by the Friedrich Ebert Foundation in 2022 to help bridge the gap between research policy and action on critical urban development issues in Uganda. Thank you for being with us today. And I end with Sana, just because all of you are here thanks to her. <laughs> your vision, your idea to bring us all together um, started a few months ago, and we are deeply grateful to have your vision contributing to this conversation. You are an associate professor, Sana, of political science at the Aga Khan University Institute for the Study of Muslim Societies in London. You hold a PhD from SOAS, and you have held different positions um, at the Leibniz Zentrum Moderner Orient, Berlin, and the Free University, Berlin. Uh, you are the author of a book that I highly recommend all of you to read, Refugee Cities, How Afghans Changed Pakistan, which we are really all indebted to you for, as you have changed the narrative on Afghan refugees in Pakistan, showing how they have made and contributed to cities in Pakistan and how much they need to be part of the conversation on urbanization in Pakistan. Your work centers on the themes of migration, urbanization, and surveillance, yet methodological, uh, methodologically you center on people and communities at the heart of academic storytelling. Thank you for being with us today, for being such an engaged academic activist uh, and contributor to various also uh, um, magazines and, and media, again, to make the link with the importance of media in this conversation. So thank you all for being here. Please, Professor Anwar, I would like to invite you to give the keynote lecture. Sana, Peter, I would like to invite you to take a seat by her side. I would like to start off first by uh, thanking the organizers of this event, um, Yahan University, my wonderful colleague friend, Sana, who was the one who extended the invitation first, Nassim, of course, and the pleasure, immense privilege of being in such wonderful company over here in what is now feels like my second home, uh, Nairobi. For, for reasons that I've associated with uh, a wonderful project that I've been involved in for the last two and a half, three years or so with some colleagues over here. So my academic training is in city and regional planning. So my engagement on this theme of cities, migration, and climate change across Asia and Africa is by default on the city. And in this instance, uh, Pakistan's largest metropolis, Karachi, population 20 million, where I live and work, as well as Nairobi, where I have been involved for the past three years in an extensive project on the interactions between different kinds of urban risks, which include flooding and extreme heat. In Nairobi, I would like to mention the outstanding work of my research partners, the Concrete Design Initiative, or KDI, where colleagues, some of whom happen to be in the audience today, Bozzi, have taught me a great deal about this city. As such, I have the immense privilege of relying on knowledge regarding Karachi and Nairobi and using these cities as a proxy to think about the diverse yet interrelated climate change and infrastructural challenges that ordinary citizens must endure in an everyday context of their living across cities in South Asia and East Africa. I am particularly interested in understanding and addressing these challenges in planning practice, thought and policy making by foregrounding issues of thermal justice. Researching and writing, for instance, on water challenges in Karachi and Nairobi means fundamentally that we must acknowledge how, for ordinary citizens, water provisioning is inextricably woven into the challenges of affordable housing, land, access to electricity and health infrastructures, and that these have been shaped by historically contingent dynamics as well as intersectionality. Gender, ethnicity, and class identities have been long understood as drivers of social vulnerability, to climate change, um, the way interactions between urban infrastructures such as water, climate change, and other risks play out through such social divisions is often invisible. 
So in my presentation today, I'm considering extreme heat and its implications for residents of low income, informal settlements in cities across South Asia and East Africa. Globally, rapid urbanization and increasing temperatures have positioned informal settlements and their experiences of severe heat waves and chronic heat stress, which are two different kinds of things, and the built environment as a major concern for urban climate change researchers. The Climate Impact Lab's 2019 report states that the global rate of heat-related mortality is predicted to reach 85 per 100,000 people by 2100, with lower-income people expected to experience rates of over 100 per 100,000 people. With 68% of the world population projected to live in urban areas by 2050, cities are expected to become, if they are not already, the epicenter of future cooling energy demand. Cities are critical focal points for addressing climate change impacts because of their high population densities, compounded socioeconomic vulnerability, deteriorating infrastructures, and the unique challenges posed by the urban heat island or UHI effect and wider ecological degradation, all of which necessitate careful planning and mitigation strategies. Within cities, variation across microclimates is associated with heat-related mortality and morbidity, and low-income communities are at a greater risk of injury or death during heat events. South Asia is considered very high risk, with hot seasons prolonging and changing monsoon rainfall, rainfall patterns, generating unmatched effects on living conditions, livelihoods, and especially food security. This is particularly evident in the frequency of lethal and prolonged heat waves combined with rising humidity that have killed thousands of people across India and Pakistan. Even as people have lived with heat in South Asia for centuries, anthropogenic climate change is changing its nature. In 2023, soaring temperatures of 43.5 Celsius killed more than 200 people in the Indian states of Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, with morgues full and hospitals over capacity. In 2015, a deadly heat wave killed more than 1,200 people in Pakistan's largest city, Karachi. Heat-related deaths are very, very hard to pin down. When hospitals are overwhelmed during a heat wave, it is often impossible for medical staff to dedicate the time to clinically establish it, which gives authorities the excuse to easily downplay the numbers. Such deaths also signal the deadly nature of extreme heat, on classed bodies. This has serious implications for heat health concerns in a context where nearly half of both India's and Pakistan's population is urbanized, and 45% or more live in urban informal settlements with intermittent or no access to critical infrastructures such as water, electricity, and even ventilation, which is now a critical infrastructure that we don't actually think about. Temperatures in Africa too are rising at two times the global rate. Over 300 million urban Africans will be exposed to 15-day heat waves over 42 Celsius by 2100. Children born, children born in Africa in 2020 are likely to be exposed four to eight times more heat waves compared to people born in 1960. In a changing climate, heat and heat exposure are growing concerns. Currently, extreme temperature is one of the deadliest forms of climate hazards worldwide. This burden is projected to increase as the climate warms, but it will be and already is unequally distributed, with heat exposure in some African regions, including East Africa, projected to increase by two orders of magnitude relative to that in Europe. Bouts of recurrent droughts are impacting livelihood systems and mental health as a compound risk. Climate change in Kenya is expected to increase risk and severity of flooding events, while also furthering the likelihood of drought in some areas. Temp uh, temperatures in Kenya are projected to continue rising by 1.7 Celsius by the 2050s and by approximately 3.5 Celsius at the end of this century. A study published in 2017 shows that in Nairobi, temperature, humidity, and heat index differ in several informal settlements, including in Kibera. Moreover, temperature and a thermal comfort index, or the heat index, regularly exceeded measurements at the Dagoretti observation station by several degrees Celsius. These temperatures are within the range of temperatures previously associated with mortality increases of several percent in youth and elderly populations in informal settlements. As per Amnesty International's findings, approximately 2 million individuals reside in Nairobi's informal settlements, comprising nearly half of the city's population. However, these residents are also concentrated in just 5% of the city's residential zones and occupy only 1% of the total land area in the city. 
even though we tend to focus extensively on the implications of water security in Asian and African cities, heat hasn't been reflected upon with as much force, except in the context of heat waves and that too, with limited attention paid to the impacts on cities and vulnerable urban populations. In part, this is because, because heat is understood as something that we are accustomed to given South Asia's and Africa's deep histories of living with heat. It is often said that South Asian and African bodies are acclimatized and can take the heat. But saying this is a form of racialized climate determinism. Heat interacts in multiple ways with urban spaces, infrastructures, bodies, materials, ecologies, and social settings. Psychologists have long understood that heat is cognitively deceptive. And reduced cognitive abilities can be attributed to elevated core temperature in the human body. Other researchers attribute poor cognitive and perceptive abilities to increased cardiovascular impacts on the body due to high mean body temperatures in hot environments resulting from dehydration. Notably, sensory studies have shown that people perceive temperatures beyond heat exchange, which requires understanding psychological, cognitive, and emotional states. Moreover, people's heat exposure may be conditioned by their sociality, sensorial experiences, and mobility in relation to specific kinds of spaces, informal, formal work, domestic work, or domestic settings, as well as migration from one locality or geography to another. In Karachi, for instance, at the height of COVID-19 and summer heat in 2020, people stuck indoors reported it was hotter indoors than outside, even though there was no heat wave going on. This finding is based on a project that I was involved in on a survey of 1,100 respondents from low-income households. And the survey was conducted in June and July 2020 to understand the interactions between extreme heat and COVID-19. Just as water is a critical substance to produce food, to cool our bodies, to hydrate, and even to chill, and I am thinking here of chilled water, liquid immersion, geothermal cooling, evaporative cooling, and so forth that are critical for sustaining hyperscale data centers and ice and refrigeration for sustaining cooling chains. Heat too is a critical substance that gives energy on our living planet. Think of its properties as energetic, for instance, solar energy, and even the energy fed from fossil fuels that has enabled cooling technologies, such as air conditioners that modulate our thermal comforts or our protective bubbles of the magical number that is 22 Celsius. In reflecting upon energy derived from the sun, the French philosopher Georges Bataille wrote in the late 1940s that solar energy is both the source of life's exuberant development as well as the origin and essence of our wealth. The benevolent dimensions of this energy have been critical for the varied inhabitations on our planet. In his formative piece, The Climate of History, Four Theses, the eminent historian Dipesh Chakrabarti reminds us that the waning of the Ice Age was the result of the Milankovitch phenomena, the orbital and tilt relationships between the Earth and the Sun, a relationship that gave rise to certain parametric conditions under which the temperature of this planet stabilized and enabled wheat and barley to grow. Without this, quote, fluke of nature in the history of this planet, our industrial agricultural way of life would not have been possible, end of quote, nor our technical choices and our fossil fuel fed thermal freedoms. However, if the energy emitted from the sun has been experienced on this planet as a benevolent force, then in the present moment of ongoing destabilization of parametric conditions, critical for human and non-human existence, the energy heat suggests something entirely different. I propose that we are beginning to relate to heat in markedly different ways in the broader context of the planet's warming. Extreme heat manifests in several ways, through the invisible shifting and intensifying bands of ultraviolet radiation that are inflected by changes in topography, vegetation, altitude, and impact bodies in asymmetrical ways. Certain authors suggest that by 2100, UV radiation at tropical latitudes will continue to intensify, while mid and polar latitudes will see decreasing amounts, exacerbating the iniquity of, of exposure to already vulnerable regions. Our relationship with heat is also changing in the context of the intersecting effects of planetary warming and UHIs or urban heat islands, and the resulting dynamics and intricacy of feels like temperatures, or what is the wet bulb globe temperature, WBGTs, that take into consideration the lethal impacts of humidity. The IPCC 2022 report 
has emphasized that urban areas are expected to experience increased severity and frequency of heat events. These are, this is already happening. And when combined with the effects of UHIs, this presents a particularly complex challenge of how we think about climate adaptation and resilience. At the city level, the risks are significant. If I may use the example of Pakistan, in May 22, the city of Jacobabad, which has a population of 191,000, situated in the southern region of Sindh, the city recorded six days when the WBGT exceeded the limit of human survivability, 35 Celsius. That is the limit of human survivability. Since human skin temperature averages close to 35 Celsius, or what is otherwise 95 degrees Fahrenheit, WBGTs above this critical value prevent people from dispelling internal heat, leading to fatal consequences within six hours, even for healthy people in well-ventilated conditions or shade. How does the human body mediate heat's visible and invisible effects? How is heat weaponized through architectural, social, and urban planning formations? What does heat mediation look like under these, these circumstances? For example, for street vendors in outdoor environments, or female home-based workers indoors who are enmeshed in managing heat's labor politics. These kinds of questions bring to the forefront challenges of thermal demand, water and energy provisioning, as well as indoor heat health risks. How are gendered everyday social practices within the home co-constituted by flows of energy, heat being pertinent? And how do these shape expectations about thermal comfort? This is a critical point on the invisibility of social reproduction and women's labor and their daily routines that are tied to practices of water consumption, usage and expectations, and how extreme heat is a pervasive element in a context of limited ventilation and, ele and electricity, especially in low-income and informal settlements and slums in cities across Asia and Africa. Thus, there is another side to heat. In a warming planet, heat has become lethal and stealth-like in terms of its impacts on the human body, especially in its natural ability to thermoregulate. Dr. Andres Flores, a leading environmental sociologist based at the University of Thessaly, and whose work focuses on heat injury in the workplace in both Europe and the Middle East, underscores that we owe our position today in the balance of species on this planet to our thermoregulatory system. Our ability to sweat is unique. Aside from humans, very few species sweat, moved animals and some primates. The thermoregulatory system is one of the key mechanisms in human evolution in allowing us to be able to survive nearly every habitat on this planet. Behavioral thermoregulation is also important, but this is where cooling, using water, air conditioning fans, and so forth come in, comes into play to reduce the intensity of heat exposure. How far can the thermoregulatory thermoregul system be stretched? What does endurance mean under these circumstances? What is the threshold at which the human body cannot accommodate ambient heat? Where does that threshold lie? In Singapore, in occupational settings, the highest level where you can do work is at a WBGT temperature of 32.5 Celsius. How should we define climate risks like extreme heat then in a city specific context in relation to the par parameters of physiology? This to me is a profoundly important question. In urban Asia and Africa, the impacts of extreme heat from heat waves to chronic to sustained heat, and these are different, different kinds of dynamics, are rising in large part because of people's limited and uneven access to critical infrastructures such as water and electricity and ventilation. In Dr. Alimia's excellent book, Refugee Cities, she focuses on the new language of rights that is leading to new urban identities that are less about nationality, ethnicity, and imagined communities than, quote, basic rights, quite literally having a roof over your head, um, access to water, sanitation, and food. And as she outlines, residents in refugee camps or informal settlements struggle to drink to cook, to clean, to complete ablutions, to wash clothes, and run sanitation systems. Death, as in the case of Samaya, is made worse because women especially have poor access to safe drinking water, or they remain dehydrated during pregnancy. In the city where I live, in Karachi, 90% of piped water is unfit for human consumption, and this is a city of 20 million plus. Only 28% of Karachi's residents have reliable access to piped water, and the median for total water supply per week is approximately three and a half hours. And this story is by no means exceptional. Across urban Asia and Africa, the crisis of water provisioning is deeply enmeshed in ecological transformations that have been buttressed by cycles of drought, soaring temperatures, urban flooding, institutional crises of water management, depleting groundwater reserves, intense urbanization, and what I call 
terraforming, whereby more and more land is being reclaimed for real estate development in both agricultural and rural settings, as well as on cities' coastlines. So what we are seeing basically is more asphalt and concrete being poured into, into the terra. I want to juxtapose this aspect of the city's changing ecology with a more specific issue of rising temperatures. And I would like to suggest that as we think about water as a basic human right, where or how do we situate the right to cooling in a warming planet? This is a critical question because it dovetails with the broader issue of thermal justice. Thermal justice is a concept that addresses the unequal distribution of heat-related risks and impacts in urban areas. It recognizes that certain groups, such as those with lower socioeconomic status and minority populations, are disproportionately affected by extreme heat events. The idea of thermal justice is closely related to the broader concept of thermal justice, which focuses on the fair and equitable distribution of the burdens and benefits of climate change. Climate justice frameworks, including thermal justice, aim to address these inequities by paying attention to how climate change impacts people different, differently and redressing the result, resultant injustices in fair and equitable ways. This also requires then analyzing power dynamics and the intersecting set of social inequalities that underlie the global economic system. Critical climate justice approaches, which incorporate insights from intersectional and international feminist scholarship can help foster solidarity and collective action in addressing climate injustices or thermal injustices. And I'm thinking here of the work of uh, wonderful uh, feminist geographers like Farhana Sultana. While the use of appropriate heat measures is crucial to analyze differences in urban microclimates, and particularly in problematizing how we understand heat on a spatio-temporal scale, and in relation to vulnerability, the time has come for a different kind of intervention, methodologically and conceptually, of understanding and investigating the impacts of extreme heat on vulnerable citizens in cities across Asia and Africa. At the Karachi Urban Lab, my colleagues and I have been looking at what I call layered modulations of heat as a destructive force in both its visible and invisible manifestations placed in the context of everyday environments and inhabitations, keeping in mind gendered practices of heat risk mitigation, as well as cultural context. Thus, understanding need heat mediation through architecture, social practices, clothes, cooling technologies across a wide spectrum of housing and occupational typologies, including informal settlements and informal workers. So I want to underscore a fundamental point. Heat is constructed in the built environment, right? It mediates with global warming and UHIs, but it is constructed in the built environment by social, political, and economic processes. Although heat is a deadly threat exacerbated by the way developers and urban designers construct the built environment, we do not treat it as a form of environmental pollution for which development is regulated. During processes of development, engineered materials replace living organisms and seal soils. Both processes reduce the role of moisture regulation and cooling. Engineered materials alter the reflectivity of the land surface. Industrial and transportation activities produced waste heat emissions, as do buildings with air conditioning. All these factors combine to create differential risks across the urban la landscape at granular neighborhood scales. In reframing how we understand heat, we must also go beyond understanding it as a meteorological event, to understanding it as a form of institutionally sanctioned violence. Moreover, that we separate heat from temperature itself. Temperature is a discursive concept produced approximately 300 years ago during colonial rule. Distinguishing between temperature and heat means temperature is more about determining how certain materials respond to energy fluctuation in a controlled environment than about relative warmth. Heat is constructed discursively as an objective meteorological fact. In other words, while studies are revealing patterns of inequity, they are also disembodying its meaning. While spatial mapping and statistical analyses, which operationalize social difference indices, draw attention to differential health vulnerabilities, they also reduce the politics of heat to a mere numeric value. Extreme heat, thermal regulatory disruptions, shift a person's capacity for life, altering his or her breathing, metabolism, and awareness. But the impacts of overheating are also a cultural technique constituted by manipulations of materials such as air conditioners, fans, water, food, ventilation systems, circulatory nodes, or lack thereof. The interactions between water scarcity and extreme heat, as well as ventilation, um, 
and electricity are leading to the slow onset of deaths that are differentially produced and differentially lived through being intimately tied to the social production of class, race, gender, and age, as well as how our cities have been built historically in Asia and Africa. Those who focus only on the outside may view extreme heat in comparison to flooding as a lesser evil, in part because of the invisibility and the indeterminacy of heat effects, the fact that thermal effects are varied, dependent on context, and the particularity of the human or the non-human body makes them illegible in rubrics of harm. Perhaps one of the most tangible arguments for deeper interrogation of indoor environments is from a public health perspective. The WHO has recently drawn attention to overheating indoors as critical threats to the health of vulnerable populations living in developing countries. And I think here of schools, of indoor environments and informal settlements in slums or prison systems and so many other indoor environments. So finally, this brings us to the challenge of cooling adaptation, the right to cooling and resiliency in the context of the SGD7. If I may use the example of Pakistan again, 30% of its population, that's 220 million, doesn't have access to electricity, and the rest receive an intermittent supply with a daily load shedding of six to eight hours a day. Hence, investigating heat exposure and stress in refugee camps and in informal settlements in slums and constricted environments is critical to support effective adaptation strategies. Lack of access to, to basic residential cooling when needed, which is called the cooling gap, is increasingly considered a dimension of energy poverty, and we don't even really talk about any energy poverty as, as much, though still largely overlooked and especially at the urban scale. Thus, there is an urgent need to scale up urban knowledge to inform, in a socially and thermally just way, policy and planning agendas for a climate resilient urban future for urban Asia's and East Africa's vulnerable citizens. Thank you. Anyone still catching their breath after that presentation? <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Naushin. It's uh, quite an insightful presentation. There's so much we could pick from that. And I think uh, you've already kind of like spoken to some of the responses I'm going to give to that uh, presentation that you made about thermal injustice or thermal justice for that matter. Um, I'll speak to the presentation from a book chapter I'm kind of like in the process of preparing with some other colleagues. And in this particular book chapter, we're looking at five critical elements of which one Nashim has already spoken about the element of endurance. As you've heard in that presentation, there is so much to break down when you're thinking through about the issue of heat or thermal politics for that matter. Because evidently from what she's given us, that insight, we're looking at issues around a politics of thermal justice or injustice. We're looking at power how are structures? How are they constructed? How are they maintained? And from that perspective, as Noshin has uh, forcefully presented, we need to think differently about the issue of thermal justice or injustice for that matter. The work from which I'm speaking from, that is this book chapter that I'm preparing around the issue of endurance. The broader title of the book is called Displacement Urbanisms, where we try to kind of like engage more deeply with the issue of displacement. I use the entry point of the theory of change as a way of trying to understand how refugees, displaced persons, specifically from our case studies in Uganda, West Nile region, Arua, and other smaller towns, Arua, like Koboko, to understand how refugees are navigating and negotiating so many challenges that they are facing, especially in the case of Uganda. I don't know whether you're conversant with the fact that in Uganda, the kind of policy we have in place has enabled refugees to move out of the settlements and into urban centers. And one of the unique conditions we have in Uganda is that Refugees are actually recognized, those who have moved to 
the capital, Kampala, but they are not actually recognized in other secondary cities or in other urban areas. And that creates its own difficulties and challenges. But we are looking at refugees from the Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, and we are trying to understand the modes of urban habitation. How do these different refugees engage with the issues of survival, endurance, everyday experiences? How do they access social services? How do they access housing? How do they deal with and experience thermal stress or injustice? How do they negotiate the impacts, as Noshin has uh, explained quite in depth? And another lens that I am bringing in, in addition to looking at it through the theory of change, is the lens of materiality. And I think this has also kind of like come out in Nasheen's presentation. I think it's time that we started looking at thermal stress or heat stress, thermal injustice, from the materiality perspective. How do we relate with our material world? How do human actors, the bodies, matter objects, engage or interact with their environment? Because heat is essentially something that is part of our environment. We live with it on a daily basis. And taking it further, more radically, by thinking about heat as having agency in the conditioned lived reality of our lives, not just the refugees, for example, but ordinary citizens, wherever we are. Human relationships, networks, are all subject to the presence and actions of non-human entities such as heat. And of course, in this discussion, it is important to understand that this relationship, the way we relate to elements such as heat, is never static. It is always changing. It is very dynamic. Humans are part of the material world, and that is something that is inescapable. We are not transcendent gods or magicians who are able to manipulate the material world without being incorporated or changed by it. And I think this is where the issue of heat is very important, that it is manipulating us in as much as we are also manipulating heat. Uh, Nasheen talked about heat being a produced condition. It is no longer something that we need to look at as externalized, but it is produced when we look at the way our cities are developed, asphalt, concrete, the way we design our cities. So when we try to bring the concept of materiality specifically to displacement, looking at some of the experiences we have encountered or engaged with in uh, West Nile, Arua city in Uganda, what we've seen is that refugees are trying to make a life outside the camps through the everyday as residents, as urban residents themselves, alongside other local urban residents. There's so many acts in which they're trying to make a life. I talked about pursuing all kinds of social services, human necessities, basic needs. Noshin talked about certain rights that are inalienable. And in these acts, they're exploring and exploiting possibilities between what I call the interstices of visibility and invisibility. On one hand, they are not there. They are considered to be invisible according to the policy because if you're outside Kampala city, you're not genuinely able to access state assistance. You're not, um, how would I frame this? Uh, the government essentially does not recognize the refugee outside the settlement camp or Kampala city. And yet we have so many refugees outside those two contexts. If I can give you an idea, for example, one of the smaller towns close to Arua, where we did research last year on these displacement urbanisms, it's called Koboko. Up to 50% of that town's population is made up of refugees who have moved from the camps to the town. So you can imagine the kind of impact they are making on 
the way this city is developing, the way it is changing, the dynamics in the city, socially, economically, politically, and environmentally. So they are operating in those instances, I mean, in the interstices between invisibility and we're also talking about visibility. They are not there, they are not seen, but they are also there at the same time. They are navigating and negotiating a condition of othering. They've been othered. They are considered less than citizens. In spite of the fact that they have to negotiate those conditionalities of being othered, they are ascribing their own aspirations on space. For example, through informal livelihoods, building and sustaining social networks, all these which are shared by solidarities, linguistic and cultural traditions. We realize, for example, in a city like Arua, there was a tendency, as, ex as is expected, the Congolese to kind of like congregate together, build social networks around each other. The South Sudan, Sudanese, similar. But these groups are also not homogeneous. Because we talked about, for example, South Sudanese as being South Sudanese, but there are so many ethnic groups within the broader category of South Sudanese. And we actually found out there are so many conflicts ongoing between, for example, the newer and other ethnic groups. And that also demands that the way we plan, the way we train and teach future practitioners or planners when it comes to dealing with the issue of displacement has to change radically. The refugees are essentially living with yesterday's trauma alongside today's pressures. Emotional distress due to loss of social networks and relatives, social disconnection, isolation, segregation, and conflict. These are all part of the everyday materialities of displacement. And all these are impacting on their levels of motivation, their productivity. In one case, we had a story of a woman who almost committed suicide. She had about five kids. She was tired. She was sick of the life she was living. So she dressed them up one morning, handed them over to the to a representative at the office of the prime minister, because in Uganda, the office of the prime minister is playing a major role in managing and overseeing the implementation of policy around refugees. And her plan was to go back home and hang herself. But she later changed her mind. Now, those are the realities that we're living with in terms of the materiality of displacement. But above all, if I could bring it back to the conversation we're having about thermal stress, thermal injustice, these challenges that the refugees are facing are exacerbated by an environment which is characterized by heat and heat-related stress. The West Nile region is one of the regions that in Uganda experiences heat waves, cold waves, almost on a consistent basis. And all this challenge around heat stress, heat injustice or justice is exacerbated by the fact that they don't have access to good quality housing. And that will have a knock-on effect on their health and ultimately their productivity. One interesting feature that has definitely emerged from this is that newer and older refugees are displaying very different modes of how they are living and experiencing these various challenges. Especially when you look at the way they are navigating issues around thermal stress and associated risks and hazards. Because now we need to start talking about, as Noshin has said, or talked about, what are the risks, what are the hazards related to thermal stress or thermal injustice and justice? And our thinking is that theoretically, conceptually speaking, we need to start looking at urban habitation by refugees as a continuum. From survival to endurance. It is never static. It is never the same. It is always changing. And one of the central ideas in our discussion is to look at endurance as essentially the intersection between displaceability and disposability. 
And with that, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Peter. And um, thank you very much, Norsheen, as well. Following on from these two speakers is not an easy task. And speaking to an audience who includes a number of people whose work I'm very much interested in and whose work I admire and who I'm looking forward to learning from during the course of the day and perhaps tomorrow is both intimidating and also an honor. Before I begin the response to Professor Unruh's lecture and to Peter Kasaija's reflections um, on their own work too, I would like to just thank again the Graduate School of Media and Communications, the ISMC, the Governance Program, Nassim and Irvay and the entire team at Samuel Hall for putting this together um, and the documentary uh, film screening with um, Samir Amin later on today. In a scholarly tradition too, I must also start off by acknowledging how much I am indebted to the work of Professor Norsheen Anwar, who I first met in 2013 in a workshop in Pakistan on the borderlands of Afghanistan and Pakistan. It was quite a fun occasion and I think that, uh, that memory has been crucial to our uh, bond, I think, over these years of shared intellectual interests as well as shared interests in mountains and monkeys. Um, over the years, Noshin's work has been crucial in paving the way for understanding the complex and layered ways in which urbanisms of the global south are changing. That Noshin is, in her new work, enunciating the connections between Asia and Africa is important to bring to light the shared pasts, the shared colonial histories, the post-colonial histories, as well as the contemporary issues of lived experiences, gendered struggles, and structural inequalities. On these questions of urbanism, migration, and climate change is crucial because it allows us and urges us to think together, to cross boundaries, and to imagine new futures together. Today, in the next few minutes, I will briefly be reflecting on Professor Anwar's examination of thermal injustice, as well as reflecting as what has been discussed by Peter Kasaija. And I'll do so by drawing from my own work, Refugee Cities, How Afghans Changed Pakistan, a book that is an ethnography and oral history and based on archival analysis that tries to weave together a people's history of migration, war, and belonging. And the book is something that centers on low-income refugees, undocumented migrants, as well as citizens living in informal housing areas that we have become so accustomed to when thinking of cities in the global south. These informal spaces that are positioned on the outskirts of cities that touch the rural to urban interface. Allow me, however, to start off somewhere else and to shift the geography. And I'll start with a quote. The cold of 20 winters. I'll begin. I am aware that I have been stateless for nearly all of my 29 years, that I have lived and grown up in a refugee camp on the edge of a desert. That except for those freckle-nosed bureaucrats in the West who from time to time descend and endorse the shipment of food and warm blankets to me, I did not, for all men and for all they knew, exist on the face of this globe. That I was robbed of my sense and purpose, of my sense of worth as a human being, and was forced to line up obscurely outside UN food depots each month. And when, for two decades, I feared, I feared only the cold of 20 winters. And when I dreamed, I dreamed only of the food that others ate. This excerpt is from the 1972 memoir, The Disinherited, Journal of a Palestinian Exile by Fawaz Turki. Turki is a Palestinian writer who was born in 1940 in Haifa, today a city in Israel, and he was writing about displacement as Palestinians who were forced into refugee camps in Beirut, Lebanon. Turki now is 84 years old and lives in the US, continues um, on in their writing. And I wasn't planning on bringing on my response starting to Norshin's work with Fawaz Turki, um, perhaps because of what has been unfolding and being live streamed across our screens over the past few months. 
I couldn't help but drift from script. But I also turned to Turkey today because when I was asked to respond to Noshin's work on thermal justice and thermal injustice, it was these lines that kept on coming to my mind. When for two decades I feared, I feared only the cold of 20 winters, and when I dreamed, I dreamed only of the food that others ate. I read The Disinherited perhaps 19 or 20 years ago, but writers, be they scholars, be they journalists, be they media practitioners, be they storytellers, when they are fearless of confronting and revealing the truth, have a way of searing onto our memories words such as these. Searing onto our memories the corporal realities, emotions, and sensory experiences, the fears, the wounds, the cold, the heat, the hunger of their subjects, or in Turkey's case, of themselves. For those of us such as myself and others who are in this room today, who choose to write social histories and people's histories, who choose to write on the margins and from the margins, Turkey's words remind us of our obligations to take seriously and to center as best we can the voices, the lived experiences, the bodily and sensory experiences of those who are forgotten, those who are dis disinherited, or as another writer, Arundhati Roy tells us, to give voice and space to those who are deliberately silenced, or preferably unheard. Alongside the task of documenting and bearing witness, and creating spaces for methodological disruption and interventions in the works that we do, the writer, the scholar, the journalist, the storyteller, also bears responsibility to contextualize and render visible the structures and conditions that allow inequalities and injustice to persist. Turkey does this in the passage that I have chosen to bring to this space with you today. So too, of course, does the work of Noshin Anwars. So too does the work of Peter Kasaja, and so, do I, so too do I try in my own work. On the question of thermal suffering, Professor Anwar asks us to consider that temperature is not something that is disembodied. It is not an apolitical thing. I think what we have learned from you today, of course, is that experiencing thermal suffering with attention to heat, as well as the cold, is bodily, intimate, and political. Indeed, citing the late, great urbanist Mike Davis, Unruh tells us in her writings that shade, that thermal justice, is, of course, an inalienable human right that we must be striving for. In my own work, the vulnerability of the homes of refugees and citizens in informal housing areas as well as refugee camps that are vulnerable to ecological disasters or being uh, swept away in floods or flash flooding or of being subjected to extreme heat or extreme cold or facing extreme conditions of poor sanitation were widespread. Alongside documenting deportations or cases of, law, of, uh, of violence enacted by law enforcement agencies, something that I won't delve into here, the book in many ways is a testimony of life on vulnerable ecological frontiers and how it is that people try to contextualize this and also navigate this. But the book is also clear that ecologic, ecological vulnerabilities do not impact everyone in the same way as Noshin's work also attests to. Ecological vulnerabilities are the consequence of what another urbanist in South Asia, Arif Hassan, calls an anti-poor bias that still seems to shape how we plan our cities. There is an ideological choice that is often made that chooses not to center the life of those who are the most vulnerable, the poor, or the lower middle classes, or the refugees. In Noshin Anwar's work and Servet Rikar's essay elsewhere, the idea for urban planners is oftentimes, in the case of Garaji, to produce sanitized, secure, cosmopolitan spaces that are quite happy to eliminate the undesirable and the underprivileged. The fact that 5% of Nairobi's uh, land occupies over 2 million persons is a testament to this. In my own work, of course, refugees and non-citizens are often terms also most affected, not just because of um, 
vulnerabilities shaping the global south and the city, but because of longer term failings of legal integration that is oftentimes upheld by governments, but also the international humanitarian aid regime that is quite happy with the status quo persisting, with solutions being tabled, but not really structurally changing anything on the ground. Simply endorsing a shipload of food and warm blankets, as Turkey said, seems to suffice. The cold is a form of thermal injustice that I know Noshin's work elsewhere also addresses too. And the cold that I mention here uh, by Turkey, but also in the communities in the low-income housing areas that I work to, was a cold that instilled fear. Thermal injustice means that thermal inequalities don't affect everybody in the same way, so we need to imagine solutions in a different way. For the communities I worked with, cold was something to be feared. In my own work, refugees settlements and informal housing areas would be purposely positioned on the outskirts of the city to be pushed away to make that sanitized and cosmopolitan city space. In other cases, that rural to urban interface is the only place where affordable housing is available. But being situated on this outskirts or on this so-called margins also means a greater exposure to development, to the elements, to not having shade, or to being vulnerable to the open air at night or in the summer. It means lesser connections to gas, electricity and water lines that circumvent, that could help circumvent climatic shifts. Yet in the rural to urban interface communities that I was working, what was always interesting to see is quite close by, there was always a gated housing community too, that was home to the upper classes or the middle classes, or that was being developed and pushed forward by urban developers. Here, the cold wasn't something to be feared, but it was romanticized. An opportunity for some chai and samosas, for getting a cold blast of air, but also at the same time being able to warm up when you get home because you have access to the gas line, to the blanket and to the heater. When I was reading newspaper archives about my own work that situates on a 40-year-long protracted refugee situation, that of a France in Pakistan, the headlines that I frequently saw included, for example, February 1992, refugees die from the cold. 10th of May 2021, 15 refugees die from the heat, jalousie. 12th of May, the camp is not suitable for human beings. Meanwhile, in the informal housing area, which features in, in refugee cities, I was told from residents, it gets so cold at night, in the cold seasons, but also in the summer, and I fear the cold so much, it's painful. When you go outside, there is no light, light you feel like you're in the middle of a grave, graveyard. What is striking about the headlines, in contrast to the testimonies that I collected, and in contrast to Turkey's uh, excerpt that I've shared with you, is that the headlines almost tell us that the cold or the heat appear as these autonomous agents that have their own pathways, a ruthless killer that could strike you or you or you at any time. But, as Noshin Anwar's work tells us, the cold or the heat, these thermal exposures that lead to vulnerability and test the physiological limitations of the body, are enabled on different bodies in different ways and are a reflection of institutionally sanctioned violence. They are forms of structural violence. The refugees, the people who are reported in the headlines, do not die from the cold. They die from being spatially positioned by government actors as well as other international agencies, as well as other forms of power on the outskirts of the city as a consequence of their non-citizen status and as a consequence of a failure to legally integrate them into the country too. They also die, of course, as a consequence of this anti-poor bias that still continues to shape classed lives too. They die also as a consequence of global factors, long-term patterns of war and conflict that are enabled and upheld by colonial pasts and colonial presence. Often when we think about issues of thermal justice, of heat, of water, of resources, of refugees, of displacement, of climate justice. We're often in the policy-oriented worlds and in government and governance issues, concentrating on singular isolated issues at both of the point of analysis and the point of solution. Yet the more important and pertinent question to ask, as Noshin Anwar's work does, and as Noshin Anwar urges us to do, 
is to look at the interconnections that produce these conditions, that produce rising heat temperatures or drops in them, or that produce the forced displacement. How are these conditions created and as a consequence of unevenly distributed politics, spatial, political, and other power relations? How do they manifest themselves as a result of material inequalities and of legal inequalities? For the people who I spoke to, they were very clear. The ecological vulnerabilities that they were subjected to did not impact everybody in the same way. And they were very clear that their suffering was as a consequence, as a denial of basic material conditions that were due to them. I quote here, what does the government care? We are the poor and for them, we are nothing. But this poverty is not our doing, it is theirs. Or from another quote, they, the government, have left us here on this rural to urban periphery without anything. Periphery, I add. What's important to note is that thermal injustice doesn't impact everybody in equal ways. And if, particularly for those of us who are working with those who are non-citizens, refugees, undocumented migrants, those who seem to occupy a position of limbo, as is the case in Kampala, recognized within Kampala but nowhere else, what does legal vulnerability and legal status mean in protracted displacement contexts? Here we see that the issue is not simply about anti-poor planning or an anti-poor bias or urban planning, but it's also a bigger question of what does legal integration of non-citizens look like, because legal status does change the access to rights that one is available, that is available to somebody. In the case of Pakistan, there are many things that we can learn from the East African example, particularly in the longer term durable solutions for refugees where legal integration has been offered in a number of contexts. Perhaps then when we think of the cold and when we think of thermal suffering, we'll be able to move beyond the idea of chai and samosas and really being able to address the structural inequalities that shape and govern people's lives. Thank you very much. All right. Great. So we have an hour left, an hour for discussions with all of you. I have, I will use my privilege as the chair to start off with a few questions. I have three sets of questions to also give you time to gather your questions because we want to hear from you as well. And we want you to be able to ask your questions. Now, maybe um, thank you for wrapping up the way you did, um, Sana, as we covered the spectrum from conceptualization, bringing in the work of philosophers and urban planners uh, to end on very practical, concrete, durable solutions approaches, which many of you are involved in, in, in your different works and lines of work. So my first question has to do with how we operationalize some of these concepts, some of these urgent issues into how we think and how we work um, as different actors in this ecosystem present in the room. Noshin Peter, you used two correlated uh, concepts, human tolerance and endurance. They're both, um, they both relate to human suffering, human bearing of conditions that they can't control. Um, they're scientific issues, they're political issues, uh, but they're also personal issues. Different groups will also react different ways. Different individuals will have their own thresholds. So given these multiple dimensions, how can you help us understand how we can operationalize? What methodologies we can also use? You mentioned some indicators, some acronyms that many of you might have not been aware of until today, and they're important for us to know. How can we operationalize what you taught us today, whether it's in policies, programs, in research, uh, on migration and on displacement in cities? How can we bring this conversation into our work? Um, and then related to, to that question, Sana, you ended on the importance of legal rights. You spoke about structural violence um, that maintain populations in vulnerable situations. You spoke about how legal vulnerabilities compound this climate injustice. So you gave us already some inroads as to what you think needs to be done. But if you can help us within your decolonial approach, understand how we can further this agenda. Um, how we can make <laughs> how, how we can make this process more sustainable. Help guide us, Sana, on how you think we can translate 
your recommendations into our work. I'll start with you, Professor. Thank you very much, Nassim. Those are brilliant questions. I'm not sure if I can answer um, in quite sort of the substantive way that we would need more time. I mean, this, the, the conversation on extreme heat and indices and data production and research and knowledge and conceptualizations and methodology could continue ad nauseum because there is an emergent field. It's called critical heat studies. And critical heat studies, which has a very, very distinct urban dimension, and also dovetailing with physiology. I mean, physiology is a field that fascinates me. And I had absolutely no idea, uh, you know, uh, five years ago, six years ago, a decade ago, that I would be spending an inordinate amount of time in conversation with physiologists and reading their work. Physiology has a very specific kind, it has specific kinds of colonial roots as well, uh, in terms of how the the, uh, the human body has been treated in the medical scientists, medical science and medical anthropologists have, had, have written extensively on it. But I think one of the most important things in terms of how we understand the effects of extreme heat on the human body and even sort of non-human bodies is to engage with physiology. And it's not epidemiology. People often think, well, oh, we're talking about heat, then we should be bringing epidemiologists into conversation. No, it's not epidemiology. Epidemiology is important, but actually it's physiology that needs to be addressed. And I think secondly, uh, in a very, very simple sense, but, uh, but the simplicity of this is lost in conversations on heat, then when we talk about extreme heat and its impact on the body, we, we sh we, we're talking mostly about ambient temperatures. Um, ambient temperature tells us nothing. It's actually the only measure of extreme heat out there today. There are many, many different measures, uh, but possibly the most accurate measure, even that one has contested, is the WBGT, the wet bulb globe, because it takes humidity into, into consideration. Because the humidity aspect is the feels-like aspect, right? So you have the that one temperature, which is the mercury reading, uh, you know, which is announced by the media, or you'll see it uh, reported uh, elsewhere, but the actual, you know, the, the feels like temperature is the one that takes the humidity. So people, will, will, you know, in Jacobabad, for instance, which is considered one of the hottest cities in South Asia and perhaps across the world, you know, people will say, well, you know, 48 Celsius in the afternoon, midday, we, it's routine. It's always happened here. There are distinct reasons why the temperature is rising in Jacobabad. It has to do with global warming. It has to do with UHIs, but it also has to do with, uh, uh, you know, with, with, other kinds of issues. It has to do with changes in in uh, in agricultural activities. It has to do with how uh, water is becoming trapped. It has to do with flooding. It has to do with the rising humidity because of certain kinds of ecological changes. So there are these complexities in the environment that are impacting how we think about extreme heat in the context of cities like Jacobabad. And Jacobabad has been the, a poster child over the last uh, five to six years, especially since May 2022, when it crossed the 51 Celsius, you know, because 35 Celsius is like where the human body survives, is what physiologists say. It could be even lower if you're elderly or if you're a child, it could be much lower. It could be 32, it could be 31. So this is still kind of a, a field of, of, uh, of tremendous experiment, of, um, you know, of, of uh, a kind of a laboratory. But at the same time, there is also a sense of urgency in terms of producing knowledge and data about this. So I've been spending a lot of time with medical scientists, physiologists, doctors who work in emergency hospitals, actually the Akhan University in Karachi, and I've learned a great deal with them from them. And one of the things that I've learned is that heat is very, very hard. Heat deaths are very hard to detect. And so if a person is brought into the medical room because he or she died instantly from a heat wave, that's one thing, but then there's chronic heat. So chronic heat is very different from heat wave as a one-time event. Chronic heat is sustained temperatures, sustained rising temperatures. So in Karachi, where I've done extensive amounts of work taking data from, uh, you know, from, um, from specific locations, uh, the same thing has been done for Nairobi also. I haven't been involved in that research. Others have. So when we when you take that specific kind of data into consideration from different, different um, uh, nodal points, you learn that, well, you know, in Karachi, 60, 60 years, the temperature has actually risen. Daytime temperatures have risen by 1.5 Celsius, nighttime by 2.5 or 2.6. And so it means that nighttime warming is actually going up. And this has to do with UHIs. Now, if sustained heat, which is longer summers, sustained heat has become uh, you know, a reality. So the heat wave has to happen maybe once or twice a year, maybe over a period of a month and a half, two months. But sustained heat or chronic heat is lasting longer and longer. So what does that mean when you when you separate heat waves from chronic heat? So you're looking at the effects of chronic heat on the human body. So it's a slow death. And this also has to do in, in medical terms of what is known as the harvesting effect. And again, very difficult, very difficult to show. And there's a wonderful book 
called, um, uh, oh, by this uh, historian, it was actually on the Paris heat wave. I don't mean to compare, but the Paris heat wave in 2003 killed around 15,000 people. And uh, there's a very interesting planning history and architectural history involved in that whole story as to why there were such high deaths, not only in elderly, but also homeless people. And I mean, the whole data on that is absolutely fascinating. And fertile isolation, that's what the book is called. And that's where I learned a lot on, on medical terminologies and the harvesting effect is that you could be exposed to very, the human body could be exposed to very high temperatures in a given moment in time, but the effects of that might lag six months or six years or even 10 years. So kidney disease, a certain kind of a kidney disease has emerged and that there's somebody out there who's actually uh, been funded by the Wellcome Trust, I think on a very fascinating project on the impact um, of extreme heat on health, looking at a specific kind of a kidney disease that has emerged as a result of extreme heat in Africa. I can't remember the specific specifics of that research. So, so there is a kind of a new language, new forms of knowledge that are being produced, but its relationship with the built environment which is also part of nature is a very important one to understand. And where planners, urban planners and architects and engineers, you know, what role uh, are they playing in terms of the production of this kind of heat, right? And, and that there are colonial roots to this, um, you know, and, and there are presently developmental world city aspirations. All of this is feeding into real estate development speculation whilst we're simul simultaneously talking about the iniquities of uh, the impacts of extreme heat on health and informal settlements and slums and low-income settlements. We're also seeing in city like Karachi and also Nairobi, where my colleague Bozzi sitting over there from KDI and I, you know, we're working on this extensive project funded by the British Academy, you know, infrastructure, infrastructure planning, more asphalt, more concrete being poured into the environment, uh, whereby heat human health concerns are actually kind of being sort of dropping by the wayside. And these conversations are not part of of the broader imaginary in terms how we need to reboot our thinking, where engineers and, and health workers and planners all need to sit at the table and have these conversations together, right? That what does it mean to retrofit cities, right? That's a very, very popular term these days. What does it mean to retrofit cities? Is it sort of making an apartment block and, and you know, 60% of it has green, a green forest on the, you know, on the, on the balconies and, and the roof notes, that's not enough, you know, because that's also greening gentrification. And there's tons of literature on the issues of greening gentrification. And that also dovetails with issues of how we handle heat uh, in terms of its effects on the built environment and how the built environment itself is being weaponized in the context of global warming and UHIs and so forth. So, so I think that starting off with really simple terminology and then thinking about these kinds of investigations, and I think that sort of we are at a very critical juncture now where we need more research, more data, and uh, so it could start with really simple conversations and then take one us forward, you know, in terms of having deeper conversations with medical scientists, urban planners having deeper conversations with medical scientists. Not happening yet, actually. So I'll just leave it right there. Uh, okay, I'll just add to Noshin's uh, submission around uh, what should be the starting point when we're talking about operationalizing endurance, for example. And uh, for me, in addition to what she talks about essentially as a radical change in the way we approach academically, how we approach these particular issue like endurance. Uh, one of the things that we've been pushing in terms of boundaries or radicalizing is the engagement with local knowledge, indigenous knowledge. This is really important because over time we've tended to kind of like throw it under the rug or keep it on the margins thinking that it is not scientific. What is scientific anyway? And the thinking here is that scientific knowledge or the Western scientific knowledge or evidence needs to be backed up or needs to be integrated or needs to, uh, we need to have a kind of like a hybrid approach to all this kind of knowledge where we also engage with, bring into the conversation, local knowledge, indigenous knowledge that has been around for a very long time. We're looking at ages of uh, generations in terms of uh, this knowledge that has been built up within uh, communities. You have uh, so-called um, social libraries, um, networks that could be tapped into for us to generate that knowledge and bring it to bear on scientific knowledge. And I think that is one of the critical aspects when it comes to operationalizing something such as endurance. How do we bring into the conversation local knowledge before we start even thinking about radically transforming the methodological, the conceptual, and the theoretical approaches in the way we deal with this particular issue. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point um, in terms of um, 
how do we bring in local knowledges and local forms of solution, especially in urban environments that are changing so much and so dramatically. Um, thinking of solutions to kind of like heat and cooling and what have been techniques used both within cities but also in rural areas as well. And I think what I would always urge in these situations and when we're talking about what we do when we bring things to the table is we should bring them to the table in a meaningful way because a lot of the times when it comes down to urban planning or transformation or implementation, we know that the tasks of governance of policy, of implementing these plans is also, it's a big bureaucratic affair. It's not a small game, right, to be engaged in these projects. But how do we then engage in these conversations? We can have the conversations. Us sitting in this room will have a meaningful conversation. We will be saying that these are the people that we need to talk to. These are the methods that we need to engage and employ in. And what often happens in both academia, in, in policy circles, in governance, is you get time to time key methodological frameworks become really trendy. So, you know, the decolonial framework has been the latest one that has been quite aptly criticized in many ways, because oftentimes it's taken and adopted by various organizations within the academy, within the left, within social spaces, where it's kind of like, okay, we're going to do this. And I'm like, okay, well, what does decolonial mean? Right, because decolonial in the tradition of literature, in the tradition of anti colonial, anti racist, radically equalizing politics, is very different from kind of like having a conversation in in a very safe space right it's about having conversations that are actually genuinely bringing in people into the conversations now, how we go about doing that is not an easy task there's not kind of you know um you know it's not but it's certainly not something that can only be confined to the office and it's certainly not something that can only be confined to the academy and it has to be engaged with communities in and outside of these official professional spaces too, right? These are conversations that have to be happening in this way. And, and I think that's what's something that I will always emphasize for us to be engaging with in our work in the spaces, the conversations. I know that when I sit here with the two of you, the three of you, we will probably be in agreement of, of all of these things. And the question is, how do we make it actually meaningful in what it does? And, you know, sometimes people have referred to my work as decolonial and I get really angry. I'm like, no, it's not decolonial. I just, because it's kind of become, you know, I'll give a very simple example and I'll go off script, but, you know, a very simple example is there was a, you know, I was in a health clinic and they said, let's decolonize birthing. And this was in Europe and, um, you know, and I'm like, what does decolonized birthing mean? Um, does it mean lack of medical intervention? Does it mean, what does it mean? And I was asking the people who put the pamphlet together and they're like, no, well, there's higher mortality rates of black women in Europe by eight times, for example, in the, I'm like, well, can't we just call it anti-racist birthing policies, you know? So, you know, I want us to think about the terms that we're using. And, and I think that becomes really important for practitioners, for policymakers, for scholars, for people who are working on the field and people who are from the communities who are engaged in these processes of change. Um, and I think I just wanted to mention on Noshin's point of like, what does the city look like when we're imagining how we challenge and uh, challenge the you know how we challenge the challenges how we challenge the challenges of heat and of rising temperatures and having those conversations of urban planners with the physiologists of looking at what the impacts are because much of what you are speaking to and it's a reflection of course today you're speaking about extreme heat but much of your work is also looking at broader environmental effects on people on ordinary lives particularly those from low-income marginalized backgrounds and much of urban planning is riddled with these inequalities right that have longer-term effects of chronic illnesses Nairobi as a city which has incredibly high asthma levels across the population if just on this third Parklands Avenue as you were talking I was just thinking of all of the apartment buildings that are kind of like going up and transforming this landscape that are leading to various forms of pollutants and if we compare it with Karen a very nice leafy neighborhood in the city you know why why are these inequalities within the city what are the longer term historical structural factors behind it how we can we have conversations that are really talking about meaningful distribution for the communities that are part of the city and how can we enact those changes whilst recognizing recognizing why those inequalities are there. And those are conversations not always that people want to have, right? Because sometimes we don't have the power ourselves as individuals and as organizations to change it, but we should still address a truth, right? And that's kind of perhaps one of the things that I think is important. 
allow me one last question and then the floor will be yours. Um, related to this and related to your previous talks, you all three um, spoke about invisibility of heat, invisibility of certain populations, inaudibility, unheard voices. And this is an issue we all know in the field of, uh, of our studies and our work that we mostly study, work with, work for populations that are largely still invisible or unheard and inaudible. Um, so thinking about that, you've written, Professor Anwar, in your work around distributional concerns um, within cities and in extreme heat situations. You invite urban planners to get involved and, and other scientific fields. You mentioned very concrete concerns around uh, you know, stories you tell in one of your articles in November 2022 for the Institute of Development Studies, where you speak about the death of one elderly woman, and again, how deaths are recorded. Her death was recorded as a result of a roof falling over her head. But actually, that's not the root cause of what caused her death. What caused her death was the processes of um, um, of resettlement uh, and, and urban planning that was being misplanned and led to subsequent, subsequently disaster risk mitigation. Thank you. So how we look at root causes, how we look at how deaths are recorded, you came back to that very often. Can you please comment for us, you know, what those, how we can address those distributional concerns and what, you know, what other invisible risks perhaps you want to mention that we haven't mentioned today that you think we need to be aware of and plan for to make it more visible for us. Uh, and Peter and Sana, uh, similarly commenting on that, you also talked about um, mental health as an invisible consequence of all of this. Uh, and all of you spoke about also, um, you gave Peter an example of, of a woman and they're obviously a, a gendered perspective on all of this that we need to have the disproportional impact of all of this and all of these injustices on women specifically, um, from women in Kibera to women in Karachi, from Afghan refugee women to uh, internally displaced women, their dignity, their health, their survival is constantly tested. So I'll leave with one open question around what could a feminist agenda uh, on this nexus of climate mobility um, and cities look like? We have an ongoing research on this, so this is also for my own shaping of this research project. If we can bring gender into the discussion, how would you promote it? Thank you. We can start. I want to go to the prof. <laughs> okay, so so very quickly, um, you know, we, want, we would like uh, our esteemed audience also to join in. So um, starting off with what you were talking about in terms of distributional concerns and how these are pitched in the media, especially. Um, so if I if I may take um, Karachi as a proxy again, because that is a city where I've lived and worked extensively and I use it as a sort of a laboratory, if I may use that term, to think about some of the big challenges that all of us sitting in this room are concerned about from climate change to housing to infrastructural upgradations, issues of equity and social justice and thermal justice and so forth. Often in the media, uh, and this is certainly the case in urban Pakistan, and it connects with Arif Hassan's longstanding and very esteemed urban planner and uh, social activist, that urban planning in Pakistan has been anti-poor for many, many decades now. There are colonial roots and post-colonial roots, so the native poor population has always been the one most vilified. And this also dovetails today with anti-croachment drives. This is the case in India also, and very much legalized uh, as well in India's courts, um, court system that, you know, you want to clean the city, the first place to clean up are the slums and the informal settlements because they are ultimately, you know, the sort of the dark mole. They are the, the, the you know, the, the the bad part of the city. They are, the, they are the pollutants, right? That's where all the pollution is coming from. So these sorts of things are actually now in a very pernicious and a very insidious fashion uh, connecting with the disaster risk mitigation policy, policies. And that's where a lot of the invisibility lies. And there's not much discussion on this. And this is where maladaptation issues come in, come to the to the forefront. So in Pakistan, um, the issues of urban flooding in, in a city like Karachi have been uh, sort of on the plate for several decades now. But now these are dovetailing with climate change related issues. Precipitation has become, Peter and I were talking about this earlier, 
um, rainfall has become heavier. It's become unpredictable in the context of, of Pakistan. It is impacting cities like Karachi. It is also further exacerbating issues of infrastructural degradation. So these are the compounding risks. So what are the impacts on, on local lives? So people have lived in riparian regions uh, across the nalas or the, you know, the natural water channels of the city for decades. But because uh, the city has never, municipal authorities have never taken responsibility to upgrade the sanitation system, sanitation again, very, very, very important issues. So these water channels have become polluted, they've become choked. So when you have heavy rainfall due to climate change issues, uh, you know, it, water, um, rising water is not what it used to be. So disaster risk mit mitigation policies, policies coming from top down, backed by military authoritarianism, which is another story in Pakistan, means that these are now being turned into uh, anti-encroachment drives. Those very people who have lived in these riparian regions for decades and those informal settlements have suddenly become encroachers. So the, en the kind of engineering that is being deployed now, again, very top-down, disaster risk mitigation policies that are supposed to curtail um, ecological destruction, curtail climate change impacts, are actually now themselves triggering new forms of violence. And it's these new forms of violence, actually, that we really need to turn tune into that whilst the IPCC report is talking about compounding and cascading risks well how are disaster risk mitigation policies that are actually quoting the IPCC issues then actually in turn triggering and promulgating uh, promulgating new forms of violence and risks right so this is something that that I feel needs to be brought to the forefront in a far more um, you know in a hard-hitting fashion and, and media is not talking about this media is not making these connections right so this is the revanchist city amazing work, work done on this in places like the Philippines and Manila and Manila and Jakarta also the revanchist city and what it means in terms of you know what are the disastrous mitigation policies that are actually triggering these sorts of these new forms of violence in revanchist cities and then with that uh, you know coming back to the talk of extreme heat uh, from a policy angle, um, you know, there's a lot that is still invisible, that is still lacking. India is a little bit more sort of, um, and I'm thinking here of the work of uh, people like Dr. Janni Singh over at um, the Indian Institute for Human Settlements, uh, doing amazing work on uh, local um, adaptation heat action policies. And she makes a very important point as to some of my other colleagues, we've been involved in an extensive heat related project across India and Pakistan and, and, uh, Indonesia and, and uh, Africa in Cameroon, actually, and uh, my colleague Alok Kandikar over in, in Hyderabad in India, you know, that we need to start thinking about heat adaptation policies that are, again, not top down, not engineered from top down, um, you know, thinking and, and top down planning systems. So we need to be far more cognizant and more tuned into indigenous knowledge, local knowledge, whichever way you want to contextualize it, that people know the impact of heat in their lives. They know what risk mitigation looks like. How can you scale up this form of knowledge, which is something that I touched upon very briefly at the end of my presentation, uh, so, so that we can then start thinking about um, literally curating locally informed heat adaptation plans, which are tuned into local climates, right? The microclimate angle. Cities are complex systems, big cities, especially very, very complex systems. You know, you could travel from one part of Karachi to another or one part of, of Nairobi to another, and you would be experiencing different climates at the height of a heat wave or under chronic heat dimensions and different built environment and scales and vegetation. So if you have a one-fit-all heat adaptation strategy, it's not going to work. And the other problem with that, of course, is that if you think that that putting in an, an emergency, uh, you know, meteorological, uh, there's a meteorological event coming and you need, you know, there's an emergency information system in place through the media and people should stay indoors. There's a problem with that because the indoor environment can actually heat up in, in far more serious ways than what's happening outside. And this has an impact in, in gendered ways, right? When women working in small environments, you know, 20 square yard homes where, you know, where the, the kitchen is literally your bedroom and, and it never stops cooling. It, it doesn't cool. It never, ever cools. It doesn't cool at night. It doesn't cool during the day. And there's a heat wave. So the, the heat element, right, that the whole production of heat is becoming far and far more insidious and deeper. So it's it's a call to action. It's a call to rethinking methodologically, conceptually, in policy terms and action terms. And it's a big call. It's a big call because it also means that we have to be interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary in terms of how we situate ourselves about the these distributional injustices and these distributional concerns. Um, okay, I, I think I'll just take another perspective. Uh, Noshin, you've uh, spoken extensively around the issue of policy and practice. I'll take the angle of uh, pedagogy. 
the current policymakers and practitioners are coming from specific schools, schools of thought. They are trained in a certain way. So our thinking is that the way we train and teach development practitioners needs to change. We need to transform it radically from what we have actually been doing. And uh, one of the things that we've been doing at a research unit at Makere in geography department called the Urban Action Lab is engaging what we call community professors. So rather than students going out into the field to experience certain realities, for example, around poverty, inequality, and all these other issues we're dealing with, we get community members to actually come into the lecture rooms, the lecture halls, to give first-hand accounts, experiences of how they live their lives and their realities. And through that exchange, because it's not just about us going out into the communities, but also providing that space for them to come into the universities, into the training spaces to engage with these future practitioners, we think that is very impactful in changing these future policymakers, practitioners, when it comes to the issues that uh, Noshin has been talking about. These are the very ones who are going to be making policies tomorrow, from the lecture halls into the offices. And whatever ideologies that they have picked up in the training process, in the process of pedagogy, that is going to shape, inspire, the kind of decisions that they'll be making in future in terms of the actions in relation to the challenges they're trying to address and solve. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And no, I think that's a really interesting kind of way because also it's bringing the stories. People are forming their own stories. They're telling the stories rather than it being constructed from the classroom. And um, I think I'd perhaps just discuss what does a feminist agenda look like for urban planning? That's kind of like a big ask, I think, you know. It's a big ask, what does a feminist agenda look like? And I think that the only way that we can have a politics of liberation, whether it's from a feminist perspective, from a class perspective, from racial inequalities in cities that we know exist, for example, Nairobi, of course, we know the legacies of settler colonialism and racialized hierarchies. We understand this. The only way I think that I would be interested in having these conversations is if we approach it from this intersectional kind of like approach and perspective where the feminist agenda is about understanding what does a better life look like for a woman uh, who has maybe shaped and layered by class or an ethnicity or race or religion, depending on the context, whether it be Karachi, Peshawar, Nairobi or Mombasa, but also to be able to give space to men who may be also subject to, to, to class inequalities, right? Because what I always think is important in the works that we're doing is to understand inequalities and how different um bodies, different peoples, different individuals will be shaped and affected in different ways as a consequence of these different positions of power that they may wield within society. And also, you know, as a feminist, um, as an anti-colonial, anti-racist feminist, I hope, I also understand, we also understand the importance of understanding how patriarchy, of course, also has significant implications for forms of masculinity that are considered acceptable or not, that it's not just a binary issue, that there are all of those people and genders and in between who we also need to account for as well in terms of what does equality look like for them in the contexts of urban planning. But we also understand that there are certain men within our communities and populations and groups who will also not necessarily have the same um, you know, rights and privileges of a woman who may be of a higher class standing. So for me, the agenda of kind of like, and this is not to sideline or diminish issues that pertain to and affect women and affect girls, but it's about having a broader conversation where we are all a part of that conversation. Because for me, a remaking of our worlds has to include the men side by side with it too, right? So what does that look like is perhaps the angle and perspective that I want to consider. And I think for the communities that we all work in, um, these are communities that are living and engaging with each other side by side with each other. So what does that look like and how can we keep that on the agenda? And perhaps because we're coming from this context of Afghanistan and Pakistan, where gender is sometimes over debated in the sense that gender becomes the thing to debate as a brilliant scholar and colleague and friend, Pernese Musawi Natanzi says, she calls it gender bazi, the gender game. 
right, that is often played in policy making in institutions, particularly when it comes to Afghanistan or Anila Dolitz, I calls about the tropes of the Muslim woman or the tropes of the Afghan woman or of the Pashtun woman who needs to be saved and liberated. Sometimes just the focus on gender uh, can also be stifling to the solutions that need to be had. In Afghanistan, we of course need to be talking right now, and you'll probably know much better of education, but we also, and lack of rights for women being able to access education, but we also need to consider the structures of violence and economic sanctions that are leading to poverty that mean that many women and men are not being able to access food and healthcare and rights and all of these things. So sometimes we need to be able to move away from gender bazi too and be cognizant and conscious of this. Thank you. And you're welcome to agree, disagree in a respectful tone. I would have loved to answer that, but I'm not going to have the time. Uh, so please, Jared, over to you and over to all of you for questions. I'll go around and pass the mic. Thank you so much, Nassim. Can we please uh, give a very big round of applause to this amazing team? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think you'll all agree with me that they have really done justice to the conversation of the day, don't you? Right from the top level of it, what I picked from the entire, you know, conversation has begun was just sort of helping us to understand the interconnectedness, you know, on uh, this conversation we speak about, you know, climate change, biodiversity, you know, ecosystems and the, the larger impact that it has on human systems. I, I bet most of us or perhaps some of us did not maybe know the multi-layered aspects of perhaps hit, you know, a conversation could be. And that I think would uh, speak much to maybe the work that you do from a day-to-day -day basis. I, I also perhaps, you know, I mean, admired the other introduction of the aspect or the concept of urban informality. And with that, getting a range of experiences from Western Uganda to the other part of Asia, and of course, very particular you know, examples and all this. And that, again, this conversation that just ended right now in terms of the plenary exchanges, the introduction of the pedagogical aspect of how policymakers and pract practitioners would really contribute to the, you know, next steps on, you know, taking action to some of these issues. And then I know that uh, there is also the angle of, uh, you know, um, you know, feminism. I know sometimes uh, feminism as a word is said, some, some of us cringe and they think it's going to be only a women affair. And I think what is we're being really exposed to is that, you know, and there are instances that even men make some of the best, you know, feminists, as Nassim sometimes would put it. So the conversation should be all, you know, inclusive to include both men and women. So that also we are very cautious of some of these, you know, terminological components, especially that are actually informed by different, you know, communities. And with that, I just sort of to reiterate, you know, one of the things we are trying to achieve, you know, with this, you know, lecture is to create a really open space where people can learn and discuss issues with each other in a respect to, you know, respectful environment. To make this uh, possible, I want to sort of just share with you some key pointers in terms of uh, principles of engagement during the Q&A. When you have the mic, please introduce yourself and ask a short, smart question. We really want to hear from everyone and get through the session. So if we cut you off, we are not being rude. Step up, you know, step back. If you end up asking a lot of questions, consider letting others speak. And if you haven't spoken, just know that we would want to hear from you. And it would also provide another chance to still get questions and have this conversation beyond this space. So over to you. I should be having some mics on the end, far flanks of the room. Uh, somebody can get it from the side? Yes, thank you. Where do we start? Over there, yes, uh thank you. Okay, so I'll try to be very short. Um, first of all, I just say thank you to the conveners of today for organizing this really, really fascinating event and to the speakers really for enlightening us on these critical issues related to climate dynamics, which a lot of us actually wholly do not appreciate. So beyond so drought and flooding, looking at these notions of climate or thermal justice, which is certainly quite new for me. So my academic work has looked a lot at refugee issues, particularly here in Nairobi, gender, access to work, digital inclusion, and then trying to look ahead at these now really topical issues related to climate, flooding and drought, but not considering these deep issues that I hadn't thought about related to um, the vulnerability to heat in these cities, particularly in Africa and Asia. And then this notion of 
institutionalized violence that could be considered by states themselves in the sense of how they look after citizens in or urban citizens. So the very, very three quick points I wanted to make or questions was in reflecting on this progress globally on uh, recognizing this as a phenomenon. Um, I wanted to ask if there was an example of an Asian city or a city elsewhere that has really demonstrated um, in a way that um, right of citizens to thermal justice through maybe an adoption legally of certain building materials or uh, recommendations to use certain materials, green spaces, beyond just the wealthy parts of the city. So really addressing the kind of poor areas um, and then having those conversations you mentioned with communities. And then the second point would be to follow on that is, have we made any progress on global conventions on thermal justice? And has it been recognized as a phenomenon at that level? Um, and then thirdly, of course, in, in light, it really sort of following on from the theme is to think about those measures. So global measures of thermal, city thermal vulnerability, if you like, a bit like a corruption index, but a, now an index related to thermal issues. Have we done anything on that? And if not, is it because it's so difficult? And what about, is there progress thinking along those lines? Sorry for the long question. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll be taking the first round, three of them, and then we move to the next. Robert, who has the mic? If you have the mic, please go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm Jafet Gola. Mm, climate change definitely affects all of us directly. However, it remains majorly a discussion within academic halls and conferences like this. What can we do in a more meaningful way to ensure that communities in the villages, in urban settlements, who are directly affected by climate change come to understand really what you are talking about. Thank you. Thank you for keeping it short. Behind there. My name is Andira. I'm a refugee researcher, originally from Sudan, but I live in Kenya. And uh, my work generally is on refugee-led organization. Um, and uh, today, um, very interesting conversations, by the way, but I wanted to um, know how does ways of um, life of people, especially in Africa, affect these conversations that we, we've we had today. Uh, coming from um, a diverse state in the first place, and then later at the refugee camps where we have communities that are farmers, pastoralists, and all these uh, ways of life and coming to stay together. How how does this contribute to these conversations that we are? I would really want to, to see that as well. Yeah. Thank you. Could you please just respond to those first three and then I'll take another round. Okay, thank you. If I may respond to, to your questions. I'm sorry, you didn't introduce yourself, so I don't know your name. Okay, Holly, thank you for those brilliant questions. So I'll keep it really short for all three components. So is there a, an example, uh, no ideal example, unfortunately, but perhaps we'll get there. So a couple, several things are happening. So in Africa, I think, uh, I can't remember which country, but in that city, they have appointed heat officers. And that's really, really important, really super important. This is also happening in certain parts of India. Um, so, so when you appoint heat officers, you're really kind of coming down at the more granular level of trying to get a sense of what's happening in different neighborhood when it comes to issues of heat waves and extreme heat and chronic heat and so forth. And then how can you actually, from policy intervention perspective, um, uh, curate, organize proper plans and actions that that uh, speak to people's needs on ground and perhaps also take local knowledge into consideration. The extent to which this is happening, I've, I have no idea. In India, there's extensive talk, although action uh, is very slow on locally generated heat action plans. I know colleagues who are working on those issues. Um, if, if I can take the example of the United States, there is actually now an acknowledgement in the United States on the relationship between redlining, old histories, right, of... Uh, Urban planning, real estate development in the United States, redlining is a you know a form. Redlining in the U.S. goes back to the 1930s and 40s, when loans were being provided in certain neighborhoods in places like Chicago, New York City, were redlined. That these you know they will never get a loan because this is where minority populations lived, uh, racialized populations lived essentially. That those very neighborhoods that were redlined 
in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, which was kind of the apex of the whole airlining history of urban planning history of the United States, vis-a-vis -vis redlining, those are the very neighborhoods that are now being impacted in the, under the most deleterious terms in, in, in terms of impacts of extreme heat. So that conversation has now come to the forefront. And I think that gradually, um, from a policy perspective, one is seeing something happening, maybe not on the level that is desirable, because that would require really deep, deep structural changes in terms of how cities in the US are built and a recognition of the histories of racialized violence embedded in urban planning in the United States. You know, but that hasn't happened at that. Singapore is a brilliant example of how academics and policymakers are really reaching out in very substantive ways on uh, thinking about um, and actually implementing action at the local level on heat adaptation and resilience and so forth. I take a lot, lot of cues from Singapore, but then that's also, there's a lot of money there, there are a lot of resources there, there's a lot of privilege there, those sorts of things. Uh, so your second question, no, thermal injustice, it's not part of a broader conversation. I mean, you will not see this conversation in the cops. Uh, is there an indice or a measure? Perhaps there should be one. Perhaps there, there should be a deeper conversation on how this indice or measure can be can be generated and, and the importance of having one also in the first place from, from a perspective of, of climate justice and so forth. Perhaps it's perhaps there is good reason for that. And I'm glad you you brought it up. So I'll keep it right there. Yeah, perhaps I'll just uh, add something to what uh, Nosheen has uh, responded in uh, relation to her questions regarding uh, what is actually being done, because essentially what we're seeing is that nothing much has been done. Um, the thinking here is that we need to think more about, when it comes to policy, we need to think more about the thresholds, the tipping points. We are talking about tipping points, for example, in relation to flooding and all these other events, but when we come to the conversation around thermal justice or thermal injustice, I think it's important that globally we start thinking in that direction. What are the thresholds? How do we redefine these thresholds? What are the tipping points? And I think that is very important in that conversation. Uh, regarding the question he raised about making this whole conversation relevant to communities that are actually impacted or living with these experiences, um, the response is... Uh, would reflect, I would uh, reflect on um, a case we had in Uganda, a new district called Ngora District. We were doing a research, a study last year on uh, the localization of climate finance. And one of the things we found out was that there was a project that was undertaken by this district and it was successful. And the only reason why this particular project was successful is that the community was not only engaged but it was given the opportunity to actually lead the whole process. It was around restoration of a natural wetland. They had a lot of knowledge that the public officials had no idea about, granular knowledge around animal species, bird species, as far down as insect species, because these were communities who could actually share narratives, stories about how when they heard certain insects over a specific season, then they knew that the rain season was coming, but now everything had changed, but the officials had no idea whatsoever about all this kind of information. It was only through that engagement and giving them the opportunity to actually lead in that particular project that it turned out to be successful because they had no idea what they were dealing with or what they were walking into. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just... Just very briefly, I think, uh, thank you to the question from the RLO and also from the uh, how do we engage with local communities. I think sometimes the language that we use, certainly, I think you're correct within these spaces, you know, we may know what we're talking about, but do the people outside of this room know it? Well, of course, they live it and are directly affected by it. So I think being able to kind of, you know, understand and translate that you know why is it that certain crops are not growing as a consequence as a off for the pastoralists who may have been displaced and moving into new areas how or people who are living within local communities why is it that the crops are not growing how is this connected to broader issues of climate justice being able to translate that because it is day-to-day -day life that is being affected directly by climate change uh, in that local kind of like granular level as well as what Peter is mentioning and being able to have that conversation in that language of daily wages of what you're able to earn or what ye crops you're being able to yield becomes a crucial way of having that conversation and being able to bring climate conversations to the local level 
and of course listening to the people on the ground. And I think what's interesting in terms of is there an example of a place where we can see cities having done something really well? Interestingly too, I can't think of a city, but I can think of local communities within cities, right? I can think of neighborhoods that show us really good examples. Here I'm thinking actually of Islamabad in one of the informal housing settlements of Gajiabadis, where a lot of low-income households are using solar energy because of the heat as a way of kind of like navigating the heat. So they have set up panels within their homes, within the local neighborhood and did that through community mobilization and organization to be able to mitigate these kind of like circumstances of heat, right? And you see people coming up with low levels in these microclimates in local communities, but is it taking place at a broader kind of like, uh, you know, is there a city that we think of that we aspire to? Um, at the moment, a lot of the conversations about urbanization still remain asphalt oriented, right? And that until we kind of m genuinely move away from that conversation, now there've been attempts in different kind of like UN initiatives of the green city, you know, of planning and the green city. But again, it's not kind of going beyond that kind of like surface level because also people want the, you know, the logics of capitalism, people want to make money and more and more people move towards the city you know, we are living in the Anthropocene or an urbanized kind of like planetary urbanization is taking place at a rapid scale. More and more people need to move to the city. So where do they live? They're gonna live in a high rise because it's quick and easy to build versus a green space. So it's also connected to migration, right? And yeah. what do we do? Also just thinking of Saudi Arabia, you know, where they're building that. What is that? What is it called? That, that... The, the new. The, the, the new project. Yeah, that line that through line. the desert. I mean, that's that's the new aspirational moment, right? That's where... So exactly. asphalt being poured into the desert. Exactly. Asphalt being poured into the desert. So what does it look like? So that, that becomes crucial, I think. Thank you so very much. Well, one very clear deduction from those responses is uh, you know, related to the response to Dr. Holly's question. I think uh, at the moment we are seeing very clearly that there is a gap at the global and regional level as far as conversations on thermal justice is concerned. And here we are already at the local level speaking about it, I think it's a bad opportunity that I missed, you know, opportunity because we were building, you know, bottom up and we will get to a point that, you know, really have the whole world awake to really respond to key indices around thermal justice. Thank you so much. Back to you. I'll take five and then, uh, yes, we get back here. Who has the mic? Hello. Yes. Uh, hi, thank you so much for a wonderful lecture. So inspiring. My name is Teresa. I work for the UNDP and my question to you related to this last point that you brought up was about we have seen innovations in technology that have uh, in urban environments <clears throat> created in uh, they have uh, built in nature-based solutions into housing structures and I'm thinking of one example which is the vertical forest in Milan that has created a new ecosystem in a highly polluted urban environment. This is for the rich. The apartments are for billionaires. And I wanted uh, to, um, yes, and I wanted to ask if you had any references that you can recommend on how these, on how local knowledge and replicable technologies uh, can be utilized in poorer countries in urban areas and by the communities that are now most exposed to thermal injustice. Are we yet there? Uh, can be replicated, can be scalable, or is it a, a massive gap that we need to fill? Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. I'll keep it short. My name is Rufus. I work with the Embassy of uh, Netherlands. Um, maybe from a development uh, perspective, um, maybe what is the paradigm shift that is needed in terms of how we finance um, you know, the different humanitarian or development programs in the refugee camps? Uh, and I'm thinking here particularly from more in terms of like the shelter, because when you talk about uh, heat, if you go across many of the refugee camps or IDP camps across the world, um, the typical, and, and, and I hope UNHR is not here, even if they're here, it's still okay, or you inhabit that. When you think about the corrugated iron sheets, I mean, we, Nassim, we've gone through Somalia for many times, and when you see the kind of responses, is it time for donors um, to also be brought into this kind of conversation and pull the plug in terms of also how we finance? So I'm looking more in terms from a financing perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Joshua Adem. I come from Hope Hospice, which is in the health sector. And uh, I'm very much interested with the, our first speaker's uh, uh, key address. Madam Sana, you, you sound a medic. 
and uh, I've captured a lot from you. And uh, this is what I want to know from you, how we can handle this. In our medical field, I've walked along up to where my brother from Kampala is coming from. Uh, the heat, the heat problem is now becoming an uh, epidemic, not only in the refugee camps or in the informal sectors, but it is becoming a communal kind of a problem. So in the field we see, we, we, we have uh, noted a lot of uh, uh, what we call the heat stroke, if you understand. We have also some uh, blood clot. And also you find that most of the, the patients who come to our uh, medical services, they develop what we call a drug resistance in, uh, in, this, in, in that field due to heat. For example, somebody having uh, meningitis, and then uh, you, the, the temperature is high. And then the climate there also is high. You see, it becomes a problem. Now, my question to you is the immediate measures where which we can handle so that because life is once, not tomorrow, just today and now. So I'm asking how, what are the, the, the immediate measures which we can take so that we, we overcome or we manage the medication measures so that we also help the humanity from being uh, diminished by the, this uh, we call them uh, abrupt deaths or occurrences. Thank you. That is you. And number two, number, the last one, the last one to Mr. Kasaja. Mr. Kasaja, you spoke about the, the indigenous knowledge, which I saw to be very much imperative in this field. So where can we start from? Because according to what you have managed in Gulu, I think it is Gulu or Arua, what can we also get from that practice there so that we make it something global from the indigenous knowledge so that we we handle this climate and heat issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is Judy, and I'm moving this conversation in northern part of Kenya where I work, and I'm trying to understand heat vulnerability. Um, where does culture, where do we place culture, where do we place system of uh, living, and uh, about indi merging indigenous knowledge with academic knowledge, and where do we consider the way of living related to culture? And one example is uh, from the com community I work, the, the way they build their indigenous houses and the way they, the, the way they live. How do, how do heat vulnerability being merged or will, how will it be achieved without, um, without uh, interfering with cultures and communities. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, um, yeah, I'm okay, thanks. <laughs> so, uh, so I think, let me ad ad sort of address the first two or three questions, which are actually, they have a lot in common, which is about what you raise, uh, the questions that you raise, what can be done. Uh, so there's a short term and there's a long term. A, the, a new modern city or a world-class city is, is disabling Right, street vendors right to shade, a street vendor's right to be in public space, to be seen, to hold his or her cart in, in a particular kind of a of a lane or an avenue where he or she has situated himself for, for years and years to, to sell their wares. So these kinds of things are also part of this very violent process of urban planning. So when municipal authorities are disabling people uh, in terms of access to public spaces that are also shaded spaces, then Passive cooling measures also become very hard to sustain, essentially. And the long-term access, uh, access to shade or cooling measures is about active cooling technologies, and air conditioning is one of them, right? And air conditioning is, is not affordable to everyone, and air conditioning is also part of the broader conversation on how it actually emits right, certain kinds of, uh, of harms in the environment that add to global warming. So what kinds of technologies do we need? So this is why I mentioned at the end of my presentation, the SDG 7, that the United Nations has recognized as the most important SDG, which 
all other SDGs actually hinge upon, which is the right to electricity, which in turn is about the right to cooling, essentially. That if you don't get your energy systems right, then the issue of active cooling measures to enable vulnerable systems, risk mitigation and adaptability, adaptation in the, in the context of, of global warm, warming will become harder and harder and harder to achieve. So there is actually a figure that the United Nations uh, people at the UN have quoted, right? That something like one, I don't know, one billion or three billion people across Africa and Asia that don't have the right to cooling. I mean, it's absolutely staggering. And this number is increasing every day. And there is a sort of a classed racialized aspect to this, that those who increasingly have access to active cooling, you know, the demand for, for air conditioners is rising on a daily basis. And those who are demanding it and getting access to it are actually wealthy populations, the elite populations, middle to upper middle class populations. So there is this increase. So the, the increased divide, the divided city, which we have talked about, the dual city that we have talked about, the narrative of the dual colonial city, the divided city, is actually right now also pivoting on this whole issue of who has the right to cooling and who doesn't have the right to cooling. So passive forms of cooling in the short term, but also very much contingent upon how municipal authorities would allow it or not allow it. And then also these active cooling measures, which are more long term, which are driven by technologies, complex technologies, air conditioning systems and so forth. You know, and uh, so so it's complicated. It's really complicated, and ultimately, it really does have a lot to do with politics. Um, thank you for such a broad array of kind of questions. Um, I think one of the questions, and I think we'll just given the the time, we'll speak to to all of the questions, um, or, or weave in and out of them. In terms of the paradigm shift, something was mentioned there. Um, in terms of what you know, what does shelter look like, and these corrugated iron sheets coming out again? I think when it comes down to particularly refugee housing or displaced persons housing, there's been a really amazing body of scholarship that looks at how it is that housing for disaster management, which then can lead to protracted displacement contexts, are not really designed with the people in mind, right? It's not designed with the people at their heart and their needs. A lot of the time, for those of us who work in refugee settings or displaced person settings, a lot of the discourse will be around how unclean or how unfriendly or how unhomely the homes are that are being put together by these um, by disaster kind of like management relief agencies or, or different UN agencies. And urban planners are trying to bring this, who are working within these refugee communities, of how it is that we can kind of like humanize space, how it is that we can recenter people and what they need. There was really amazing work that was being done in Gaza about what it is that rebuilt homes need to look like and how they can become personable and how they can have elements of emotions as well as kind of, you know, being able to be sanitary, being to be able to clean, to have thermal spaces, but also can be homes, right? And a lot of times it's disaster management and just putting up these corrugated iron sheets. So I think on a very practical level, how can we reconsider disaster management for refugees, for displaced pers persons, with the view in mind that, of course, in some contexts, these disasters will be short term, but in other cases, they may be longer term, they may be protracted. And that really comes down to kind of like how we imagine refugee spaces or undocumented person spaces. This is where RLOs are crucial points of uh, interaction to engage with. Um, and a lot of the times, because we're not taking this into account, the refugee becomes simply that, the label, something that is not a person, that is not a full complex layered human being. That is, you know, to be eligible for refugee housing, you have to be a refugee that is suffering, that cannot be complex and have layered forms of emotions and forms of belonging. And that really has to become central to how we understand development and engage with disaster relief. Um, and then there's, you know, a question of political classes. I think you'll have to forgive Noshin and I, who are probably coming from a Pakistan context, who have learned to self-censor and don't immediately bring the elephant to the room, which is oftentimes kind of because there can be forms of surveillance on us in terms of how we do our work as well. And I think uh, ultimately, you know, the political classes, as well as the mechanisms of how the states function in the post-colonial context are crucial and they are the elephant in the room with these broader historical kind of structures that do shape why there are roadblocks, why there is change that happens, why it's the street vendor that is targeted versus the high rise of an elite class. And those political decision makings and that political class that has an interest in maintaining the status quo, that has not got a problem with taking another IMF loan and all of these concerns, they are the elephant in the room that does actually need to be addressed when we're talking about policy and academic work. Um, and I think 
we do do that in our academic writings, but perhaps we've just learned to condition ourselves a little bit in the, in these kind of public spaces. But I thank you for bringing that because I think it's an important point to keep in mind. Um, and there was also this question, and I'll just keep this very brief. You know, um, can we think of imagining indigenous cultures or different ways of kind of like planning the city? And I think, you know, Nassim, you mentioned it at the start, you know, at this current moment, of course, given the political context, but also in other settings, you know, I, Europe is not the future necessarily, right? Fanon said this in 1961 to bring Franz Fanon back into the room. He should often make some appearances. But, you know, he said in 1961 that Europe is not the future. Uh, North America, urban planning in these kind of like things where they are so heavily dependent on fossil fuels, on gas, on energy, it's not the future. And I think that this becomes comes back to Peter Kasaga's point you know, indigenous kind of like knowledges and cultures, they really do have to be centered if we're going to, if we are going to actually meaningfully challenge planetary urbanization that does affect, of course, Africa and Asia the hardest. And the question of resilience, you know, does resilience kind of like cover up stuff? I mean, resilience and endurance are terms that we use, but buildings should be resilient. People don't necessarily need to be, right? We want buildings and infrastructure to be resilient, to weather the storm, to be able to be part of communities, but communities and people and us and the people who are working, they shouldn't have to be resilient and to endure violence in structural forms, in physical forms, in corporal terms, time and time again. This narrative, I think, is also worth pushing back against, right, of this resilience, because then it means, yeah, sure, Africa can deal with it. They're used to it. Well, no, there are structural conditions that mean people are accustomed to living in violence rather than encountering it, but it doesn't justify or mean that somebody's life is worthy, more worthy than the others. And I think pushing back against these tropes, in, in effect, some ways they become tropes of re resilience, need to be kind of pushed back against. So, Peter, you will have the final. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, starting with the, her question, uh, what you ended on the note regarding uh, indigenous knowledge, local knowledge, in addition to her response, I think uh, there are four important issues that we also need to engage with in relation to bringing local knowledge or indigenous knowledge into the conversation. I think the starting point should be the recognition of the importance and the value of local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, uh, respecting the local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, do we actually genuinely have respect for this knowledge? Because that is also an important issue in relation to our own experiences. You'll find academics talking about local knowledge, but when they don't really have genuine respect for it, it's simply a byword or a buzzword that they'll use in these conversations, discussions, but it goes out of the window tomorrow when they are pushing policy or influencing policy. But being genuine means it's not just about the conversation you're engaged in, but in your actions, you're actually pushing local knowledge into processes, mainstream processes around policy and action ultimately. And then third, the issue of legitimacy, I think is important. And I think it ties into the issue of uh, respect and recognition. How do we build legitimacy when it comes to local knowledge, indigenous knowledge without having negative impacts or deleterious impacts on the established culture systems. And I think that is also another important element that has to come into that conversation because we're still living in a space whereby there is still, there is very little legitimacy accorded to local knowledge or indigenous knowledge in certain contexts. And that is something that we definitely need to address and engage with. Uh, related to his question around the issue of living with heat or thermal injustice, heat stress, thermal stress. I've always used, uh, for example, our health sector as one of the exemplars of pushing messages that could actually be impacted, impactful. And here we're talking about some of these messages, for example, on heat stress, thermal stress, into mainstream health promotional messages, health awareness campaigns. I mean, we've dealt with COVID in Africa. We've dealt with HIV. We've dealt with Ebola, for example, in Uganda. And the way that the key actors have been able to address the issues or the different impacts or the challenges brought forth by these particular epidemics, 
we think that they could actually integrate the message of existential challenges like heat stress or thermal injustice into those campaigns. And that could possibly, I think, uh, make a significant impact when it comes to dealing with the issue of heat stress or thermal stress, thermal injustice. So it's about leveraging those existing strategies, um, opportunities, possibilities that have already been created to address major challenges, epidemics, with or infusing them or integrating them with messages around heat stress or thermal injustice. And I think this could be a very important entry point in trying to address the issue of heat stress. Uh, going to resilience, I think I kind of like uh, agree with the, my colleagues that it's about time that we actually started being very forceful, the pushback, rather than simply acting as sinks for all these concepts as they are coming in and we're simply swallowing them and regurgitating the same concepts all over again. We need to question them. And that's the whole process about pushing back. Do they really make sense or do they do more harm than good. I mean, you give a very good example about the resilience framing and how it has actually done more harm or reinforced certain injustices for that matter. So the starting point for me here is that we have to question, we need to push back on these concepts without taking them wholesale as they've been brought into our spaces. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so very much, Peter. I'll take the final round of three questions, starting with George. Over here that promised I'd start with him. So I'll, I'll honor that. My name is George Karanja from African Grassroots Media Alliance. Keep it very short. I would like to understand the future outlook of this work. And especially you could talk about the, the dilemma of being it being difficult to link death, mental, uh, medical stress to, to heat. So, because I believe that if this comes very more articulate, then it's easy to address policy and uh, also the messages to communities. Thank you. Thank you. Next to George. Yes. Okay. Thank you. My name is John Belokoy. I'm from Daystar University. My question will be a very simple one, but before that, I have to appreciate the speakers especially because the topics we are discussing this morning, they are not only timely, but they are also topical. Well, my question is this, in all the conversation, I've been trying to get that aspect that has to do with how do we bring in the media to be partners in progress in this journey? Because um, there's this popular saying that says that the fish begins to rot from the head. And how does this apply to the context of this conversation? If you look at the SDG, there are 17, and each one is trying to emphasize on a critical point about development issue as it affects us. But there is one aspect that is not emphasized, the communication component. And this has spawned a very serious conversation in the academia. In fact, it has led to the publication of two volumes last year called SGG 18, Communication for All. And you see, why is that important? It is because the idea of the role of the media in this whole conversation has to be inbuilt within that particular space of communication. So my question is, we're talking about indigenous knowledge, the effect of heat and all those things. Don't we think the media has a role here to play in, client, in trying to amplify the marginalized voices, in trying to shape the thinking about what we are saying? If we think mostly about policymakers, policymaking is a process, and policymaking is bureaucratic. But policymaking can be facilitated depending also on how the media tries to frame an issue as serious, or less serious. And that is something that I also want to know from the speakers. What is your take on that? How do we bring the media to become partners in progress in this conversation? Thank you. Thank you so much. 
I know that there is a Nairobi county in the room and the, the Ministry of Immigration. Are you somewhere? Yes. It has been mentioned that uh, the voice of the political class is missing. This is your opportunity to, you know. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, so thank you, uh, speakers. I think uh, as uh, uh, the previous uh, speaker have already said, I think this uh, topic is very topical. Yeah. But uh, of importance is, uh, apart from bringing the media on board, uh, the, as you are all aware, uh, the Kenya government has just uh, endorsed uh, the, the, the Refugee Act, which was uh, revised just the other day. And then we have the Comprehensive uh, Refugee uh, Response Framework that has been adopted that mandates the county governments to actually handle issues of day-to-day uh, -day, uh, refugees, migrants, and uh, internally displaced persons. So it's bringing it already down to the local authorities to deal with because they consume services on a day-to-day -day basis. So, and uh, just the other day, our governor, uh, the governor of Nairobi, uh, Johnson Sakaja, uh, appointed a refugee affairs uh, a directorate in the Department of uh, Social Services so that to deal with the day-to-day -day issues of refugees uh, in the city of Nairobi. Now, my question uh, will be, um in this conversation how do we see the law the role of local authorities uh as already put by uh my my colleague uh, my, my friend from uganda how what is the role of local authority as far as this conversation of refugee migrants is concerned and especially when you bring down to issues of climate uh issue of climate change as you are aware nairobi county also adopted uh climate change. I don't know if you've interacted with it uh, during your research uh, uh, findings, if you have interacted with that document, because there's a climate uh, action plan by Nairobi County. Uh, and we and I invite all of us to look at it and see what Nairobi is actually trying to do. So moving away from uh, tokenism to actually actions, because I think there's a lot of talking that is happening all over. And even in the climate, uh, climate justice and climate uh, uh, climate conversations. There's just a lot of talking, but where is the action? And I like what uh, um, uh, one of the speakers said about the prodigy in terms of how do we include the locals on a day-to-day -day, uh, addressing those issues. One of the things that we have done as Nairobi County uh, in integration and ensuring that uh, issues of climate justice is not just spoken, is to try and integrate uh, refugees in the climate uh, adaptation measures uh, through the Nairobi Rivers Commission, where we are actually including refugees to bring their, their input in how do we address issues of climate justice and climate change in the city of Nairobi. So thank, thank you very much. Let me leave at that. My name is Humphrey Otieno. Uh, coordinator, Sefa Nairobi Initiative, Nairobi City Council. Thanks, Amri. One final comment from uh, a person in red. Thank you, Jared. Uh, my name is Dorothy Omboto, and I'm a migration and refugee law practitioner. So we are talking about thermal justice. And uh, I may have been late, so maybe I didn't get uh, the first part of it. But I just wanted to know, uh, it seems to me that all this is still in a research stage. Maybe you'll clarify that for me. Such that, um, are you seeing any way, like practitioners like myself, lawyers and uh, maybe lawmakers, then have a role in ensuring this thermal justice? is achieved and how do you envision that? Thank you. Thank you for keeping it short and sharp. Back to the panelists, I think uh, you can each take uh, under a minute to, or maybe under two minutes to respond to all the okay. questions. Um, I'll start uh, in response to the comment raised by the public official from uh, County. Um, I think it's quite a groundbreaking event that uh, the local government has been given powers when it comes to managing the affairs of refugees in the context of Nairobi. 
And we do believe that they play major roles, local governments, when it comes to collecting the data, when it comes to implementing policy, implementing action, when it comes to monitoring, evaluation, and ensuring that you have mechanisms, systems are in place that are able to help these refugees be integrated or manage the challenges, better manage the challenges they're facing. But ultimately, I think for me, the big issue beyond the role, because the role is straightforward, but beyond that role, the question is, do they have the fiscal financial autonomy when it comes to making critical decisions about these resources that they need to manage or deal with the magnitude of challenges we are facing when we're talking about refugees moving from settlements into cities? because they are placing demands on healthcare systems, on education systems, on uh, social service delivery when it comes to waste management, sanitation, water delivery, and all these other important uh, dynamics around uh, urban governance and management. So I think it is a straightforward yes, that they are playing a very important role, but ultimately this role can only this role will only be uh, relevant or important if they are or they actually have the fiscal and financial autonomy from the central government to actually control the resources, make the decisions around how these financial resources are being used or are being uh, uh, managed in terms of addressing challenges related to refugees or displacement when it comes to for example, a context such as uh, Nairobi, given all the complexities surrounding the needs and the demands of refugees or displaced persons when they move into the urban spaces. And I think that kind of like ties into as well the question that you raised about the media. I think just as much as the local governments have a very important role, the media also plays a very important role. Unfortunately, I think it was more implied in the presentation, but you must recall that all through the presentations we've had articles being presented or being flagged and that is essentially the media it's playing a very important role in bringing our attention or drawing our attention to the issue of thermal injustice or climate change more broadly so beyond just acknowledging the role again it goes back do they actually have the freedom to operate we're talking about a context of shrinking civic space for example across uh, so much of the world. It's not just Africa or Asia, but even in Europe itself. In the US, I don't know whether you've seen the latest uh, categorization where the US, it shows that civic space is not as free as you expect in the land of the free. So for me, again, it goes beyond the role, but also foregrounding the issue of how much freedom, liberties does the media have in terms of uh, bringing to our attention these particular issues and trying to find ways of how to address them because they are the ear to the ground beyond uh, the state and all these other actors, the NGOs, and uh, that uh, particular spectrum of actors that we normally talk about in the context of uh, displacement. And uh, going back to the question that uh, the gentleman from uh, the Dutch embassy raised, it was an interesting question. He started out with humanitarianism, humanitarianism, then he dropped it and went to development. And I think he kind of like responded to the question himself, that the starting point is to move beyond humanitarianism. We are way beyond that. We are pay way past that of simply giving out blankets, tents, water. That's the tokenism we are trying to transcend or go beyond. We're trying to look at these actors, displaced people as human beings with certain needs, certain demands, who are also bringing certain values and additions to the societies that they're moving into. And therefore they need to be valued and looked at from that perspective, rather than being kept in that limbo of being visible, invisible, or less than the citizen as we describe or characterize the citizen in Kenya or Uganda or whichever country or context you're talking about. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll respond to the question on media and on Tamil justice very quickly. So if I may take the example of Pakistan, uh, I 100% agree that the media has a role to play and an incredibly important role to play. One of the problems in my country is that uh, um, journalists uh, are and other media representatives don't necessarily also have the training 
to be able to write and to to respond and to take up information and present it in ways uh, that would make sense to the general public or would have an impact on the general public. And this is largely because um, the training is not there. But so one of the most important ways in this can be done is through investigative journalism. And we don't have that substantive investigative journalism capacity in a country like Pakistan to be able to deliver those, to go beyond the sound bites. So typically what we have in Pakistan is sound bites. Someone reports something somewhere, academia presents somewhere, I will present somewhere and there'll be a sound bite. And then I look at what's been reported and say, you know, I mean, there's like three lines. I was expecting something much deeper. And so we end up blaming, blaming the media. So the media tries, but so we need more training schools, more, more. Uh, so there is where I work at IBA, there is a center of excellence in journalism that is trying its best to be able to train, um, you know, uh, men and women who are interested in the media, in investigative journalism techniques, which is kind of what you have in the United States. That's brilliant. Despite the, you know, what you mentioned, the censorship and all of that. And there is a shrinking space in Pakistan as well. But I think that the commitment, the commitment to, to investigative journalism, to deeper, more substantive reporting is a very important aspect of how then the media becomes equally accountable and has, um, you know, a stake in the broader story. This is very important. On the thermal injustice uh, uh, question by, by the lady in red, and I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Uh, no, no, there is isn't and and again this is i mean there is there's a little bit of of action on well how can you <clears throat> provide insurance schemes uh, to women um you know uh in, in who are involved in micro enterprise systems insurance schemes that would help to mitigate um the impact of heat risk i mean the the story really is only up to that point so i mean if we take flooding uh, as an example, in comparison to extreme heat, the impacts of flooding are, are immediately visible. So you could take certain people to court, you could you could litigate, you could hold people. How, who do you litigate when it comes to the impacts of extreme heat? Especially when you talk about the harvesting effect and slow deaths and things like that. Who do you hold accountable? This is, this is why extreme heat is such a stealth-like thing, um, that when it comes to precisely those sorts of, of issues, it kind of just falls by the wayside. Right? So I'll just stop right there. Thank you. I'll be very brief because I know people are hungry, uh, including myself. Um, so, but um, I think that's an important point because I think also to when you're shifting the discourse and you're trying to actually introduce something new to try to understand how it is that people can litigate against extreme heat becomes an important part of this conversation. And this is where scholarship and research and investigative journalism does become important because it starts to bring to the fore, actually, we need to start to talk about this because... 30 years ago, people were not talking about climate change in the way that we are talking about it now. So those starting points are also very, very crucial. And that will come from all of these different spaces of academia, scholarship, uh, writing, journalism, investigative journalism as well. And I think the bigger question, and those at the GSMC will know better for journalists as well, and this is something that's common in different geographies, you know, journalism needs training, but it also needs to be paid. And one of the challenges that the journalism industry is facing to a generation of 15 years ago, even in this short space of time, where journalism, you could make a good career out of it and you would be paid, right? Because you would have print newspapers and magazines and so on. And this is rapidly itself also changing. So people are less wanting to make careers out of journalism and can be their own journalists on Instagram, TikTok, and, you know, uh, what's the other one? I don't know, Twitter. Um, so, you know, so people have chosen to be investigative journalists themselves, which in many ways is liberating and a democratizing force. But it also means that there are some gaps that are falling through and where we're not getting access to those really crucial, important stories that we want to have. And of course, you know, journalists like lawyers in visions of kind of like democratic societies and participation are often the ones who are holding people to account, right? Um, and a lot of times these are the people, particularly journalists in contexts where there is shrinking civil space, but also where there may be, you know, wider powers or military powers back behind you often get picked off. So the stakes can often be much, much higher, of course. But those questions, they seem to kind of be creating this perfect storm where we have a gap of kind of like really important stories that need to be told when it comes down to the media. Because, you know, and I think this goes back to Peter, your point of, you know, how much space is there for media practitioners to be able to tell these stories. And that ties in to this point uh, on litigation as well and lawyers too. Um, 
I think as a, as somebody who's worked in, on Pakistan and Afghanistan, when I look at the Kenyan and East Afri African example of refugee displacement and integration, I often have pangs of envy. And even though there are many kind of problems still within the, you know, Uganda and Kenya, as many scholars kind of attest to, uh, in our context, you know, half a million people got deported, uh, half a million Afghan refugees got deported between September and December of 2023 by the government of Pakistan. So the idea of local integration as being on the cards would be absurd, right? Like forget kind of like, you know, forget giving rights at the local, local level, there's even a refusal to give refuge. So I think that you know, there are many things to be learned from and the refugee contexts will vary across geographies. And I think understanding what is happening at the local level within Nairobi um, becomes a really important case study for other local governments as well as governments to learn from. And at the same time, the question will become is, well, when do people stop becoming refugees? Because that's the challenge to kind of like be aware of because whilst it's important that there's these forms of local integration and a Ministry of Refugee Affairs, um, at the local level, at some point, 10 years, 20 years, five years, three years, who, when do you stop becoming a refugee? When is this label taken away from you? And this label that has mechanisms of social exclusion, but also, of course, legal exclusion that has material impacts on your day-to-day -day life in terms of access to education, healthcare, jobs, and the like. And I think that becomes a really crucial question to address. You know, if you migrate, for example, to the US, or to Europe, you assume you'll get citizenship at some point. Are we having those conversations in these contexts too? And if not, why not? And how can we have them? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. And uh, that uh, marks the end of this very amazing conversation. Um, you can please, you know, take your seats as, uh, yes. I, I don't think, I mean, we, we've really done a good job and I think, and even yourselves for being a very, you know, interactive and amazing, you know, audience to ask very brilliant questions. I have to give it up to you, you know, for really, you know, doing an amazing job.